Well, 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 balance preview just dropped. Yeah, it's coming on Tuesday very soon. Dropped out of the blue, at least not in the middle of the night this time. Uh, unfortunately, Boots is away doing a lot of stuff at the moment, so we can't do a full-fledged one together. However, I have brought him along just for an intro here. I sat down, we had a very quick gloss over the patch notes together. He's not at home, so his mic's a little bit different, and hopefully you guys uh, don't mind that too much. But I have a bit of a chat about the patch in general at the start, and then I'll go into a more dedicated, thing shortly after. That's what this video is going to be. Slightly different format for balance with boots, but I mean, come on. We couldn't have balance with boots without boots. Hey, so I only have 15 minutes to do this, so you're probably going to take over from me at some point and do the whole thing yourself. Uh, yep. So we'll just, we'll, just, we'll just get really slightly into it while I'm here, but, uh, but wow, there are some major changes in this, and a lot of it looks really good for some builds I like to use. I've already been spoiled because my inbox kind of blew up as soon as this happened that some changes here are things that I actually really wanted to change as well. So I'm really looking forward, actually, particularly in the Ranger section. But OK, so uh, let's read the intro. Uh, Greetings, fellow Tyrians. We've prepared a balance update. Uh, slated for next week, so this is coming on Tuesday, everyone. And in keeping with our push to get the release notes to you early, so you can theory craft, discuss, and prepare. Here they are. Um, so this is just minutes old as we get to record in this video. Uh, do you want to read the general section, Boots? Sure. So uh, with the upcoming update, we're continuing to create the promised trade-offs for some elite specialization lines with changes to Chronomancer Shatters, which I guess means uh, they're nerfed in some way. Uh, an overhaul of Scrapper specialization traits and some improvements to the base Necromancer Death Shroud. Uh, in, wow. All in order to make the choice of Elite Specialization more meaningful. So base Necromancer Death Shroud, that's what we were talking about last time. That yeah, well, I, I've always felt it had a bit of a cool trade-off because you get, like, reveal on there and stuff, right? People yeah. don't really value it, but... Nobody yeah. values the base Necromancer Death Shroud, and so, in some ways, rightfully so. Anyway, going on, uh, we are also doing some follow-up work on the changes to Berserker from last update to tune up a few areas. Nice. Yeah. What, what I want to see with that is the, some of the bursts getting stronger as well. You know, like the great yeah. sword burst is like crazy, but the other ones are still pretty mediocre. So. Yeah. Uh, the other main focus of this update is to uh, update is adjustments to core trait lines on several professions to address some pain points and some power imbalances. Malix, uh, Malix, more Malix changes, please, baby. Oh, man, I'm looking forward to it, yeah. Uh, finally, uh, in this update, thieves are getting an entirely new type of skill that replaces traps. Wow, really now? Hello. Apparently, okay. yeah. Okay. Yeah, because traps haven't been that used by thieves too much. There's some yeah. traps, but yeah, I get it. Yeah. I, I like the idea of a lot of their traps, but I've never really played it much. It was actually very recently that I very first started playing with, like, needle trap and stuff. But yeah. it's so ineffectual, right? It's so rubbish. But go on. For full details on these changes, please see the individual uh, profession sections. All right. Awesome. So one thing I really like straight away is we had the big berserker and scrapper, like, well change last time. They haven't just moved on from that, and they're not just ignoring that now. No. They uh, even, they even did a slight balance past afterwards uh, for, like, you know, the most egregious things, like the... Uh, the uh, great sword burst. Great sword right? yeah. burst, exactly. Yeah, I like that last time for Scrapper, it was, okay, well, here we're going to look at the gyros and turn them into wells and stuff, the utility skills. Now, this time, it looks like they're looking at traits. You know, it's nice to see that duality there. But they're continuing to work on the Scrapper, yeah. All right, so how do you want to handle this since we have limited time? Do you want to do the general section for Ellie first? And we won't go into individual changes, but... Sure, but I would like to point out a couple of things that I did read in it. All right, right. all right, let's do Ellie. Look, we both like Ellie. Let's do Ellie together. Yeah, okay, all Ellie. right. All right. So, in addition to various Tempest improvements, this update includes a major change to how core elemental specializations work. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, what does that mean? I don't know. Uh, the weapon cooldown... Oh, okay, that's what it was, yeah. The weapon cooldown traits are being merged into the Grandmaster Minor traits of the four primary, uh, primary elemental lines. So, like, oh, you sorry. know, there's a Master trait in Fire that says 20% cooldown reduction on your fire skills. That's like baseline now. That's now If your fire specialized. Interesting, exactly. okay. Exactly. So previously the cooldown trade and other available options were mutually exclusive, and its nature of letting you use your abilities more frequently tended to crowd out those alternatives. Well, that's not it really true, did. but... I uh, know, I really agree with that. I'm nearly always like, oh, I want... Really, the like even in Waterline? Yeah, uh, yeah, even in water. Well, water a little bit less. Yeah. To be fair, water, water less, but still. I'm yeah, okay. anyway, by folding this functionality into a minor trait, we are recognizing that Taking an elemental specialization represents an investment in that element's skills. 
Uh, the traits that are used to host the cooldown reductions have been adjusted to account for these changes. So they're getting stronger, maybe, right? Like... Strong. As far as I can tell, they're... some are getting stronger. I think one gets a little weaker. Um, so, yeah, here we got we got Overlord. Uh, so there's a lot of buffs, it looks like, to a lot of these things. But i just like to point out, so I have a video that I recorded um, uh, before leaving on my trip that I, I have set to come out in like a week or so, but I'm going to have to bump up the time it comes out because as soon as this patch hits, it's going to change everything about it. Oh, wow, really? Okay. Yeah, so, but it's going to be good because here, look at this, look at this. So Pyromancer's training, the 20% weapon skill reduction is going away from it. But now uh, we, got, we got Burning Rage, and this has been moved to the Master Tier as a major trait, and its functionality changed. It now grants 180 condition damage and augments the attack from Sunspot Minor Trait to have a, a 60 additional range and apply two stacks of burning for five seconds. Whoa, double yeah, burn so, on Fire Swap? Yeah, wow. so when you swap to burning, so your Sunspot does two burning. Yeah, exactly. When you swap to fire, it goes two burning on the guy, and you have additional Condi damage because of it. And yeah. with Weaver, that means like lots of extra burning. And then on top of that, they have down here uh, Geomancer's Defense, which is the swap to Earth, Oh yeah, uh, way down. I see. And strength of stone. So uh, sorry, strength of stone. It now inflicts three. Uh, additionally, it inflicts uh, three stacks of bleeding for ten seconds when immobilizing foe. So oh, on a mob, any a mob that the the build that the yeah. Has access to? Yeah. In addition to his previous effects. Wow. So we combine that with humans, right? And we play the Oka. Oh, didn't they actually change that very recently? Actually. Anyway, uh, that's kind of crazy. Strength of stone. Hold on. Strength of stone wasn't that the. Uh, that's the signet trait. That's the signet trait. Okay, that's something. Oh no 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 no! No, I'm wrong. I'm wrong. I'm wrong. That's oh. written in stone. Yeah, that's written. Strength in stone, of right. stone. Strength of is... stone. Wars two. Look at the is wiki. Gain gain condition damage based on your toughness. Oh, that, I was having that anyway. Okay, so there you go. My new my build has been ridiculously improved. Um, and on top of that, primordial stance for weavers. Uh, the recharge has been reduced. Anyway, just to let you know, it's it's a uh, earth. Conjure Earth Shield Condi Weaver. That uh, wow, yeah, that's really easy to use. So that's great. I'm happy that's about cool. that. That's cool. Yeah, that is really cool. I'm interested actually. That sounds like there's going to be a lot more weavers post patch. Definitely. I is think there so. a, Is there anything else you caught in the alley section that was particularly interesting? Uh, they rebuffed Overlord a uh, Overload Air. Like brought it. Okay. They brought it back. Not maybe not to where it was before, but they buffed it. Um, oh yeah, I see the static charge. What's this? Tempest Overload skills. Ta casting Tempest Overloads now triggers the trait Sunspot Healing Ripple, Electric yeah. Discharge, or Earthen Blast, yeah. depending on the element. That's mate. That's crazy. So Water Overload now is a massive heal at the end. Yeah, they really, they really buffed a lot of elemental stuff at this. They really did. What's like this? Flow like water. This new trait, Flow like water takes the slot previously occupied by Aquamancer's training and increases damage dealt by 10% while the Elementalist is above 75% health. Additionally, it heals the Elementalist whenever they block or evade. The healing at... Oh, okay, on a 10-second cooldown. Still, that seems so weavery as well, like War yeah, Weaver. Yeah, very kind of weavery. Evade. And it's now 10% uh, extra damage above 75% health instead of 90% health, which is always nice. Uh, do you have time for another section, or, or are we going to have Yeah, sure, let's do here? Engineer. You read it. Okay, so Scrappers are seeing a comprehensive rework in this update, targeted at improving the function gyro to be more of a core mechanic and unifying some of the disparate themes present in the trait line. These changes... Yeah, I think one of the Scrapper GMs is one of the most boring GMs in the game, frankly, at the moment. Mm. Uh, these changes aim to refocus the Scrapper as a tank-like character... How many times have we read that before, right? <laughs> ...that utilizes personal barrier applications to stay in a fight. The reworked Impact Savant trait links barrier with dealing damage, making the Scrapper a durable combatant as long as they can keep dishing out damage. The refocus on barrier led us to the removal of rapid regeneration. That was regen a lot with super speed or, or swiftness, uh, which was offering too much health recovery while remaining protected by barrier. Players still want to have swiftness and super speed though to help dish out that damage with one of the new traits, Object in Motion. Beyond focusing on scrappers more clearly around their personal barrier application, their unique function gyro mechanic becomes a ground targeted skill in the F5 slot, yeah. which can be enhanced based on trait select. Hold on, so 
So it's no longer you, just press F uh, five when you're or what well, F I guess. You you lose. Isn't this basically saying you lose the mini moa and you lose orbital bombardment on both elite specializations now, both oh, hollow and scrapper. Lose it. Yeah. So there there's your trade off right there. Yeah which can be enhanced based on trait selection and acts as a general use ability rather than a niche option for sometimes reviving an ally or finishing a downed enemy. In, in addition to reworking the scrapper traits, we're also slightly increasing the penalty for Hollow Smith's overheating. That's Hello. great. That's great. That's, it was that's already pretty main... strong. That's a really pretty strong penalty, though, like almost killing people. Oh, well, not on all builds and not all the time. I do yeah. think it was a bit. It wasn't punishing enough. But that's not the thing I would have done for Hollow to make it fairer. But anyway, uh, wow. As it wasn't consummate with the level of power granted by uh, the Hollow Forge mode. Yeah. Wow. So there's so much to look at for scrapper. Yeah. Um, yeah, more okay, like the, the the scrapper. Look at the let's just look at the scram, scrapper grandmaster traits. They're pretty. All right, I'm gonna read out the grandmasters. So adaptive armor. This trait no longer gives barrier when struck. Instead, it increases the barrier received by 15%. In addition to reducing condition damage by 20% while you have a barrier. There's so also a like... master skill that says like, or uh, there's right. there's skills that trait that say what, for every 15 15% of all damage you do gives you barrier. Yeah. Uh, so it's kind of like you get Sanctuary runes on one of the, these GMs. Yeah. Next they got uh, Kinetic Stabilizers. This trait is no longer triggered by the function gyro. Instead, it increases the duration of stuns and daze effects by 25%. Also, you get stability and suit for speed whenever you disable someone. And then lastly, Applied Force remains, which was gain quickness when you have might, but not even that much. It's, it was a lame trait. Too. I love but, it. Applied Force, in addition to its previous effects, this trait now also gives 200 power while you have quickness. It also... Why are they orienting scrap around quickness there? Because the they look really like my fire flamethrower build. It now grants quickness when at or above 10 stacks of might rather than only when above 10 stacks. Fix various oh, oh, bugs that could cause... Rather emphasis. than only when above. So, like, if you have 10 or above rather than 11 and above. Right, okay. Wow, okay, so that is a bit of a buff to a flamethrower variant, a little bit there. That's interesting. Bit. And the other thing is, depending on how those other ones work, which is like, if each individual packet gives you barrier, then the flamethrower build, that synergy we showed off, where you have like the renegade and all that kind of stuff, it might just be like a baseline experience for flamethrower scrappers going yeah. forward. Because they might, they might benefit off of the multiple packets. I don't yeah. know exactly. Actually, one more thing before we move on, though. We should probably read Function Gyro. Oh, yeah. Function Gyro. Um... So it's now just a straight up skill. Uh, it says, while Scrapper specialization is equipped, the function gyro skill now occupies F5 slot. Recharge has been increased to 30 seconds. The skill trait is now ground targeted at a range of 600, creates a lightning field at the target point with a radius of 180. Within this radius, it spawns up to six function gyros targeting up to three enemies and or allies. Enemies are finished while allies are revived. The skill uh, the skills recharge is increased by 50% for each gyro spawned beyond the first. What? <laughs> I don't understand. It's what, they're, they're so basically it's saying it's basically turning it into a like built-in a built-in um, banner like the uh, battle standard, but oh you know God. slow mo like it reses and stomps instead of instantly doing it. Wow. And because, well, it looks like the recharge. So the recharge, so it says the skills recharge is increased by 50% for each function gyro. So I assume that means the more people res or stomp, the longer its cooldown is. I guess. So, uh, yeah, I guess it's, yeah, it's a scaling revive well, skill. All these new toys. Skill. Absolutely ridiculous. I mean, next in the line is Guardian, but I have two minutes left, so I should probably go. Oh, uh, all right. Okay. All right. So we'll leave it there. Um, what I'm going to do, guys, is I'm going to take a quick break, read read ahead, a gloss over it a little bit, and I'll be back and I'll go into a little bit more detail. Thanks, Boots, for coming and uh, taking time out of your very busy schedule at the moment. And we'll be back for a full-fledged one once the patch itself drops as well with Boots. So thanks, man. No problem. Bye-bye. All right. Catch you later. All right, guys. So with Boots gone, 
Uh, let's take a bit of a deeper dive into each section and I'll try to be more exhaustive about all the little things that's going on. Again, when the patch itself comes out, I'd love to do another look at this and maybe check out some of the animations and the traits and whatnot. But starting with Ellie, in fact, I know we did just cover a little bit there, but there's actually a few things that I realize now we missed. Let's go through the list. First of all, Overload Air, the static discharge. I'm sure Raiders will be very happy about this. That's an element of the skill that I've always felt was a bit superfluous. But, uh, you know, it's not to be underestimated, and a 20% buff on it is pretty nice. Uh, Earthen Blast as well, having the targets go up to 5 is kind of nice, but I doubt it really means much. Then they did some tooltip changes for that, and the Electric Discharge, so... These are get an effect when you swap into the attunement and many years ago they made them combat only because it was actually really frustrating to run around in the open world out of combat, swap to air and then you'd randomly strike like a mower or something, you'd be in combat, really annoying. So they got rid of it but they never did the tooltip all those years ago and now they have so that's pretty nice. Uh, for Sunspot apparently it was doing damage on the tooltip that it shouldn't have been or the tooltip was somehow misreading it. Now I want to go back over this, the Tempest Overloads now triggering Sunspot, Healing Ripple, Electric Dis Charge, Earthen Blast. That's actually really huge, uh, especially for support Tempest variants as far as I can see. So let's have a look in game, right? What we're talking about, of course, are the middle miners here. And they're all really fun, right? So what that means is when I finish my fire overload now, even without being fire specialized, I'm going to throw Sunspot out. Now Sunspot is damage around me, which means the final tick of this overload does an extra packet of damage now, which is nice. But it throws a fire aura out at the end, which as a Tempest, you could be sharing in some nice ways. There's already like a water, fire, smothering auras, cleanse oriented thing, right? And now what you can do is you'll get double fire aura from a single overload. Because you can get a fire aura from this and then another fire aura that would automatically trigger from this is an interesting thought. The water overload... Yeah, you're getting a massive heal, explosive heal at the end, which is baked into this as it is. And then another explosive, this is not to be underestimated, healing ripple heal um, afterwards as well at the same time. So this is actually really nice for support Ellie. I'm very much looking forward to seeing what the devs do. Of course, a lot of support tempests run earth for elemental shielding. And I don't really see earthen blast meaning much. I mean, if that literally was a blast, trigger a blast finisher when you swap into earth would obviously be OP so I can, it makes sense but if it meant that your overload was now blasting at the end and if you managed to do it in the middle of a, a, a water field someone else perhaps had placed or you'd managed to line up for yourself that would be a really interesting bit of playmaking on the warhorn as well right um, that would be very cool but that's not there so I don't think it's too crazy but it definitely is something and well worth paying attention to next uh, we have the pyromancer's training change so, just if you're fire specialized, you don't have to trade in to the cooldowns now. That's amazing for your meteor shells, for your lava fonts, if you're a PvE, -er, and for various skills. All of these is just a significant buff to Ellie, I really do feel. Uh, and, of course, they then also roll the original aspect of the trait, which was 10% increased damage to burning foes. That's rolled in too, so you really do get everything. They're not removing anything here. But now you've got a free slot, right? Uh, the exchange they say is Burning Rage. They've moved that to the Master tier as a major trait, and its functionality is totally different. So this is what we said with 180 condition damage, augmenting uh, the sunspots to have 60 additional range and apply two stacks of burning. So you could be a Burning Rage Tempest that at the end of your fire overload is now doing this new version of sunspot at the end. Uh, and you'd just be th rolling those out. It's an interesting thought that you look at Weaver a lot for a lot of those Condi elements. But this is actually a worthwhile one to look at too. Next, you have the water one. The trait's been moved to Grandmaster Minor. Its functionality is different. It reduces recharge and water weapon skills and increases healing to others by 15%. The increased healing to others by 15% was already there. It was called Aquatic Benevolence, which now no longer needs to exist. So it says it's been removed. Uh, it's been replaced with Flow Like Water. The trait takes the slot that Aquamancer's training had, increases your damage by 10% above 75% health, and it heals the Elementalists when they block or evade. Now, we already mentioned this, but here's a really interesting element, right? This is a pretty good modifier, 10% modifier for like PvE Ellie's now, that you don't lose too quickly. A little bit of retail in World vs. World or PvP as well, you're not going to lose it instantly anymore. Because there's not that 90% threshold. But also, this is not the only modifier improvement for water. We have Piercing Shards as well. 
which has always been in game. It's while you're in water attunement, do more damage to vulnerable foes, a whopping 20%. But you got no damage in water attunement normally. So it's like, okay, cast a meter share and then wait in water. Is it very good? Well, look, they say you get half of the 20% bonus damage even when you're not in water anymore. So this trait here, this is just straight up 10% damage all the time, right? This is 10% damage above 75% health. And then you can go all the way up to 30 if you're in water. All from water. So water is actually getting pretty heavy on the modifiers there, which is really kind of funny. And you'll notice that this change is very similar to what they were doing with weapon skills recently, where they tried to give you value out of a weapon trait, even if you're not currently on that weapon. It's like they're doing that for the elements here on Ellie. Moving over to air. Aerovance's training had its change. It's merged with the uh, old trait that occupied the slot. But check it out here. Uh, you get 150 ferocity that's doubled while in air baseline. Very nice. Uh, that slot used to be... In fact, I can go in game and show you the structure of air right now. Uh, Raging Storm, which is critically hit gr to grant fury and extra ferocity while under fury. You're now going to have to actually specifically choose for this. Which is, again, kind of okay in PvE, where you'll get Fury anywhere, uh, anywhere, anyway. But it means that your middle slot here, which currently most people just always pick elements of training for most purposes, you're probably just going to put Raging Storm in that slot now, anyway. And it might not actually be much more fun build craft. But here, you'll see what they've done. Raging Storm itself was nerfed a little bit. It says the Ferocity bonus has been reduced from 240 to 180, probably because of the buff up here, right? The doubled uh, Ferocity bonus that we see up here. Over on Earth, Geomance is training. Uh, where we now see both the old trait and the cooldown reduction go together. Uh, Strength of Stone has got the bleeding whenever you remove. I think this is interesting when it comes to definitely some racial skills, but remember the new dagger rework? The dagger three in Earth is a pretty good emobe now, right? Like it's that big emobe, if you remember from the last patch. We don't really see many new skills on early this patch, obviously, any. Uh, but I think they definitely have that skill in mind when they've looked into this. Then also you have Earthen Blessing. So I'm not actually sure how excited about this trait I am. It already exists. This was the one that meant you got cooldown reductions, but also it helped you shrug off conditions coming in. The cooldown reduction was still amazing because it meant you got Obsidian Flesh back quicker. Obsidian Flesh is a really powerful skill. Uh, and now you're just looking at it for the condition element. Well, they gave it a new perk. Check it out. This new trait takes the slot previously occupied by tra Geomancer's training. It reduces duration of movement impairing conditions by 33%. That's old. We already had that. And now it also grants 10 endurance whenever the elementalist is affected by one of those conditions. So someone cripples you, you straight up get 10 endurance. Someone chills you, 10, 10 endurance. Uh, immobilization, you won't be able to utilize the endurance, but you'll get it, right? Uh, so I wonder what they're thinking there. Um, there's some interesting ideas over on Tempest as well. Lucid Singularity, the GM, that basically means you shrug off those kinds of conditions really quickly as well. But I've never made a concept like that work, so I don't know how excited about this I am. It makes sense what they're going for with the trait, though. I, I definitely see that. Burning Precision, they've increased the burning from 2 to 3 seconds. It's just a straight-up buff. Primordial Stance, a straight-up buff from 25 to 20. And Swift Revenge, this one I'm most interested in for, like, the fresh air playstyles. Uh, is now from 7 to 10. So buffs all around, uh, and people are obviously always excited about buffs. I do feel like Ellie was a little bit undertuned. Uh, however, I must say, I think even right now, before this patch comes out, some of those Condi Weaver variants are really, really strong. Like, very powerful. And it's just a lot of people haven't taken the time to learn them or really look at them. And uh, I definitely think that this will push them much, much further forward as of the next patch. Consider as well that many of the other classes are getting nerfed. What has been nerfed on Ellie? What's, what nerfs do we see here, really? Uh, so, you you know, we see a little bit of a reshuffle with the, um, the rage, Raging Storm. But uh, with all the other nerfs on top, I think Ellie comes out of this patch very well. All right, now let's look back at Hollow. There's a huge amount of stuff here that we totally missed a second ago. I'm really excited to talk about. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not going to skip in-game. My recording is being very weird. So we're mostly going to look at the patch notes on screen here for the rest of the video. Hopefully that's not too bad, guys. But there was a lot of weird freezing you probably just saw in the alley section. I'm going to try and do away with. So Engineer, uh, we already read the general description, so we don't have to go into that. But let's go into the specific changes at this large block of text here. It really doesn't even talk about Scrapper yet, and there's so many cool things I like here. First of all, though, something I don't understand at all. Overload? Overloading now disables all tool belt skills for its duration. So, 
as far as I can tell, this is the overheat change they mention in the top part of the description. But in the top part of the description, they said something about taking more damage when you overheat, right? As a uh, hollow, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, we're increasing the penalty for overheating. Well, it doesn't actually mean take more damage. I think what they, that's what overload means here. Uh, and it says it disables your tool belt skills. Now, I actually think that's more prominent. That's actually a lot more potent of a change. What it means is when you overheat, you're not immediately going to be tossing some kind of elixir at your feet and being able to disengage, or you're not going to be rapidly bursting someone down with static discharge procs or whatever. So I think that that's a nice way of dealing with the punishment without just stacking more and more damage on there. I didn't expect this to be the change at all, but I think it's quite creative and I like it. Next, you have Blowtorch. You remember last patch we saw that change, I think it was to Blunderbuss, where they said, look, scaling skills are going to be working differently. There's a ton of that going on in this patch. Here's our first example of it. Blowtorch. This skill, this is your pistol four that does that quick burst of flame in someone's face. Lots of condition damage. This skill now applies four burn that scales dynamically between three and six seconds of duration based on distance. So it's always four burn now, even quite far away. The skill now scales damage dynamically based on distance rather than using distance thresholds. So we will see a lot of that go in there and that's just a nice little thing that makes sense for that skill. Blunderbuss, this is a huge change as far as I I'm concerned. Uh, it now respects line of sight, so you guys who don't play Engineer might not think about this very much, especially in the competitive formats, but clipping someone through a wall with a Blunderbuss, a quick little rifle three, was a very common and powerful tool to learn when you became quite good at Engineer. Uh, and you know, that's a, a kind of a skill cap thing that's now no longer going to exist. But I think it makes sense that bullets are obstructed by wolves. I don't think it makes sense when stuff goes through wolves. You know that I've been advocating for line of sight checks on all kinds of different skills across the game. And well, there's a big important one. Very nice. The Bulwark Gyro. So this is Scrapper. This is the gyro that has a really cool idea. It applies watchful eye to your allies, right? Which means that you they take less damage and you take it for them. You're like supporting them by taking their hits. But the way that it worked was it also gave you barrier to be able to sustain through all that pressure. And instead of standing near allies and trying to support lots of people by taking their damage, instead, it was just a really powerful, selfish skill to use. Run around on your own, try and defend a node on your own or do something solo in another area of the game and just benefit from huge amounts of barrier with no downside. Kind of rubbish, really, and obviously not what the skill was intended for. The devs have now addressed that. Look at this. This skill now scales the initial barrier it grants with the number of allies you're actually redirecting damage from. The base barrier granted has been reduced to account for the higher potential initial gain. The barrier amount you get is no longer split by any game mode as a result, and they fixed a bug with incorrect skill facts for barriers amounts. So, yeah, you are not going to get much if you're using this selfishly, alone, on the side. And despite all the stuff with fa Function Gyro and all the trait changes that might power creep Scrapper in various ways, this is a fundamentally very strong well skill from last patch, last meta, that has been nerfed and hopefully quite substantially with their intent on this change here. So, important to look at. Elixir X... This cooldown is now 105 seconds in all game modes. This is a change I also really like. So right now in game, Elixir X is in the competitive modes on a cooldown of like 70 seconds or something. It's much shorter. And obviously there's that trait, the new trait, which means every time you like dodge, it chunks it down even further. So there is kind of a, a flavor of engineer at the moment that's about spamming its way into Rampage. On top of all the warriors on Rampage at the moment, it just means you see so many Rampages. So I'm really happy to see that Prime Light Beam will probably take precedence over a lot of Engineer builds, uh, particularly Hollow builds, of course, going forwards. I already liked Prime Light Beam more than Elixir X, but there were justifications for it, definitely. Lots of people ran it, and this means you're going to see less Rampages, either because people don't tech the skill at all anymore, or because when they're on the skill, hey, it's more seconds till they get back into it. So I love that change. I love this next change as well. Hip Shots fixed a bug that could cause the skill's projectiles to follow their target. So there's an interesting story here. When you shoot, hip shot is the auto attack on rifle for engineer. And you guys might have noticed while using this as you fire away at some creature in the silver waste or in heart of thorns and it's moving. You'll see that right as the projectile gets towards the target, it will suddenly veer off to the left or the right in a really unnatural like 90 degree turn to like smash into your target to make sure it doesn't miss. It's like they're heat seeking, seeking missiles that course correct. 
Uh, the devs have talked in the past about the fact that that little visual element is really just for your benefit as a player. What's actually happening is it's trying to have your client visually represent what the server's seeing. And the server's seeing that the bullet went in a straight line and actually landed, and they're just adding that little correction. That's the story. But it seems with this chain, uh, rifle auto attacks in particular, but beyond any other, really had that heat seeking missile feel to them. And they really had a lot of tracking, it felt like. And they were very, very clean. They always landed, even at very heavy range. Quite often, it was a very easy way to tax someone's health on an engineer by just drinking some elixir that gives you quickness, giving yourself lots of might, and just spamming hip shot. Uh, and you would make sure a lot of them would land. It was a very forgiving skill. Well, now they're suggesting there was a bug that meant they were following their target more than they should have been. This is one of those things, guys, you're gonna have to tune in for the next video and see how this actually impacts the game because that could be a huge change or it could be a very minor change. I guess we'll have to see. But if they hit a little bit less and they feel a little bit less heat seeking, I'm all for it and I think it's a positive move. Next, net shot, you could fire it backwards. It makes sense that you can't anymore, so they've changed that. Uh, I think that's actually a functionality that's come on and gone and then come on again over the years. It was definitely on for now. Next, invisible analysis. This is the trait that means as you hit someone, you insta-reveal them. Well, it now says it's also applying five seconds of fury when it activates. Uh, this was already a really strong trait that I think a lot of people were running, and now it's just even stronger. So I'm not sure why the devs did that. It doesn't say that they removed some of the other elements, right? Uh, it's just very, very, very strong in my opinion, and uh, you know, a nice little extra reason for Hollows to really solidify that choice. Next, uh, Laser's Edge. So, this is the minor for Hollow that means as your heat's going up, you do more damage. As it currently stands in the game right now, you need to get to a certain level of heat and then you get this big modifier. Well now, with the dynamic scaling, the bonus damage from this trait is now calculated dynamically based on the amount of heat you have, rather than activating after passing a specific heat threshold. Because of this change, the effect icon is no longer displayed, and bonus damage is now multiplicative instead of additive. So I think the fact it becomes multiplicative is a nerf. I think additive was stronger. Someone can correct me if I'm wrong on that one. Um, but yeah, now it just gradually builds up. And that, of course, affects the trait that means you can store more heat to uh, enhanced capacity storage units, the GM. This trait now increases the bonus damage from Laser's Edge by 50% in addition to its previous effects if you go up to that really, really hot mode. Now we get to go over to Scrapper. So the function gyro. We already read this uh, earlier. I guess we'll have to wait until we see this in game on the little boot section. I think uh, it sounds very, very strong. So check it out. The Scrapper trait rework. They've been reworked and repositioned. The specialization has changed as followed. And by the way, I like the way that they've listed this out in the uh, balance preview and the patch notes. It would have been really annoying to have to read every trait and like how they've renamed it and everything that's shuffled. This is just everything, right? It's nice and clear. So the first thing to look into are the miners. These are your always passives. First of all, gain a function gyro. Second of all, speed of synergy. This new trait causes all your leap finishers, if you're a scrapper, to give super speed to you and all blast finishers to give spe super speed in an area around you. So that super speed element of scrapper is still very much there. Impact Savants. This trait no longer increases damage while you have barrier. Instead, it converts 15% of all outgoing strikes into barrier and it reduces your vitality by 300. So the trade-off here is not only are you not getting throw your uh, F5 standard F5 abilities, but you're also dropping 300 vitality here. On a specialization, they're saying they want to be like a bruisery tanky thing. You are fundamentally squishier. You're lower vitality if you play Scrapper. I think they really want it to be about resustain. They really want it to be about barrier and they really want it to be burstable. That's my guess here. Um, so yeah, this idea that baseline all crit strike damage turns into barrier. I definitely think that there's some nice ideas of heavy damage scrapper builds that sustain through pressure, which is what they were going for. Now, here's the traits we select. Adept, first of all, you can pick gyroscopic uh, acceleration. This new trait causes wells, that's your gyros, to give super speed when they end and increases the radius. We already see this in the game as it currently stands. But additionally, this causes your function gyro to give super speed in an area where it cast, right? So as a general usage skill now, you can at range splash super speed onto whatever you want in that area. Or you can pick up System Shocker. This new trait causes your function gyro to daze in an area 
a very short daze. Uh, it improves its effectiveness of all lightning field finishes by 50%. I really hope the cast time on the gyro is evident and there's nice animation. I don't want this to feel like every scrapper has a freaking daze mantra as they're running around. But improving the effectiveness of all lightning field finishes by 50%. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean that when I do like a dazing strike out of a lightning finisher, or what is it? You get vulnerability on those? I get more swiftness duration when I blast them? I suppose that has theme with the uh, synergy with the theme of the spec, but not too exciting to me. And then mass momentum. The trait's been moved to adept. It wasn't there before. It no longer grants power based on your toughness. And instead, it's causing your function gyro to grant stability in an area when cast, in addition to causing stability to pulse might. So I really like the sound of these two, right? Do you want to CC on your function gyro? Do you want to stab your friends on function gyro? Or do you want to speed people up on your function gyro? There's a nice juxtaposition there. I think that that's going to feel really fun to pick between them as you are a scrapper and see how you can augment them. It feels kind of hollowy. I think they've nailed something there. Moving over to the master tier, we have something truly bizarre here. Uh, I wonder how this will feel. It's such a weird and fun idea for a trait. Listen to this, guys. Damage Dampener. This new trait causes 20% of all damage dealt to you to be dealt after a two-second delay from the initial strike. In PvE, the damage delay is increased to 33%. So... It, they're saying like low vitality and base on barrier, but if you get nuked from a single massive strike, like a 10k death's judgment or something, that's going to be reduced by 20%, and you only have to pay the other bit of health a couple of seconds later, by which point you may have generated some more barrier or something. So it's like splitting all your damage packets off into other small damage packets, and that has any number of different implications on how that makes us feel with like regards to Aegis and stuff. It's a really weird idea for a trait, and I kind of love it. Very, very fun one. Uh, next, you've got Expert Examination. That actually had zero changes. An object in motion. The new trait increases your outgoing damage by 5% if you have Swiftness, Super Speed, or Stability. Each boon increases the bonus damage by 5% up to a maximum of a 15% modifier if you have all three. And having Swiftness, Super Speed, and Stab all at once, even as boon and active effect heavy as the game is at the moment, is not going to be happening too much. So I actually think that's reasonably balanced. And lastly, you have the Grandmasters, which I know this is a little bit out of order, but Boots and I already read at the start of the video. Um, I know that that's a bit of a mess there, guys, but obviously we already did our little discussion on those. So there you go. That's our engineer. I'm actually really happy with a lot of those changes. Um, I really did want to see some changes to the stealth on uh, engineer, and I did want to see some changes to the quickness, access, and uptime on hollow. Uh, neither of those really changed. But I think certain elements of it have been refined down now, and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing how they feel in the next patch. So next, let's look at Guardian. I feel like if I was a Guardian-only player, uh, there's a chance I might be disappointed with this patch. My interpretation of it is that there's a lot of damage shuffling, but there are some uh, slight new toys sprinkled about. Let's see what the devs have to say. First of all, for Guardians, some power from various trait lines is being shifted around in order to create better tiered trait options. The Retribution trait in the Radiance line had a lot of power and was crowding out other options. So this is the trait that is like, while, ha while you have Retail, do a ton more damage and get, get a load of Ferocity. It was just like, Retail gives you a lot of damage. Uh, they say we're transferring this power over to the zeal line along with a few other trait reworks to make that type of damage bonus more reliable. While most symbols will become more powerful as a result of these changes, we're taking special care with the symbol of punishment due to its low recharge. The symbol of punishment is the scepter symbol. Um, for this symbol, we've reduced the damage of the extra strikes rather than the symbol itself. As you guys know, this uh, symbol drops those extra things that beat around. They're a little bit random. Uh, ArenaNet says, as they cause the skill to have unpredictable damage based on the size of the target. So, you know, you're fighting a small hitbox raid boss versus a large hitbox one. This skill uh, changes. And we've seen, obviously, with early changes over the years, they don't actually like indulging in that too much. Overall, these two changes net a small enhancement to the skill. So, what they're preparing you for is you're going to see read what looks like a nerf on Scepter 2. But with everything else, they're saying overall, it's a small enhancement. They also say additionally, we're tuning up a few Dragon Hunter skills and traits to both improve their use cases and clarify their descriptions. 
So I was very excited initially about these Dragon Hunter changes, but let's see what they do. First, the Spear of Light. Now, no, that is not the Dragon Hunter F1. That's the Spear of Justice. Spear of Light is the spear skill, literally underwater, the auto attack. And they have the dynamic scaling. So this skill now scales dynamic uh, damage dynamically based on distance rather than using distance thresholds. So really not that exciting. Next, you've got Leap of Faith. This is Great Sword. Great Sword 3. We see Great Sword all over the game. Great Sword's very strong. And, well, you get a straight up buff to this now. This skill heals you for each foe that you hit in addition to its previous effects. I like the idea of putting a heal as you land. Uh, just on the flavor and the idea and the naming of the skill. And, like, it's this holy strike, you know, as you'd expect with Guardian. Uh, but it does feel like, you know, just extra stuff for greatswords. Uh, and maybe it needed it, honestly, because we could see a couple more greatsword guardians around, I feel. Obviously, we don't get to know how much it heals for. We don't know how, what it scales like and all these things. We do know that this scales on AoE. So if you're leaping on just one person or one... Uh, you know, a big mob in PvE, then it's not going to help as much as if you jumped in on a ton of pocket raptors or scarabs in the desert or whatnot. So that one will have to remain to be seen. But I like the idea. Over on Longbow for Dragon Hunter, deflecting shots. So this is your Longbow 3. Fires a very quick shot out that pushes people away. And if any projectiles were coming, deals with those too. Well, it no longer does bonus damage if a missile got reflected. It just always does bonus damage increased damage by 80%. This is a huge improvement. It's not that deflecting shot did crazy amounts of damage initially. It's a very fast moving skill that already felt, felt pretty punishing to get hit by. And now you're going to get pretty chunked by that thing. So quite uh, quite heavy for a CC skill there. Next, the symbol of energy. Again, longbow. Don't forget that this symbol lands after a projectile fires out and actually has to hit the ground, unlike many other symbols in the game. Well, the projectile that places it now moves out quicker. And that's going to help you with your longbow 5 ward combo into longbow 4. You can, uh, you know, line them up while your target is still trapped within the ward you've created on your longbow skill 5. Uh, looking over at traits now. So, Symbolic Avenger has now been reworked. It grants the Guardian's increased damage of 2% up to 5 stacks for 15 seconds whenever a symbol hits a foe. Now it's very easy to hit a foe with a symbol on Guardian. No matter what you're doing on Guardian, you have symbols and you're going to hit people with them. So this is pretty much a very strong trait that means you're going to be running around with 10% modifier as people at least are standing in your symbols. I think what's more interesting about this is maybe in... Uh, the modes where you're against very agile mobs or you're in PvP or Wild versus Wild. People can deny you that damage more comfortably now by really trying to make sure they avoid the symbols. Which they should have been trying to do anyway. But it's, you know, another dimension there of counterplay and stuff, which I think is kind of fun. Uh, you've got symbolic power. They've increased symbol damage that this buffs from 10% as it is currently is all the way up to 30. So that's huge. Uh, the trait no longer has a chance to inflict burning, but instead it causes symbols to charge your justive passive effects twice as fast. So now for maybe some of these Condi guard builds where you do have a lot of symbol access, this means obviously your burns are going to pulse out a lot quicker, and that's an interesting thought. Next, they talk about symbol of punishment specifically. So Scepter 2, the damage of the extra strikes has dropped by 25% in PvE. Just so there's not this, this big discrepancy and difference between the size of the hitbox you're fighting in raids and whatnot. And you'll notice that, that is a PvE only nerf. It's not a nerf in the other formats. That's definitely what they're thinking about. Next, symbolic exposure. The trait now increases damage to vulnerable foes by 5% in addition to the other stuff it was giving you. Protective reviver apparently was bugged. That meant it wasn't giving you increased revive speed. On the, like, epitome of a support class in Guild Wars 2. The class to fulfill that fantasy. No one really took the revive trait very often anyway. Uh, it obviously has that really powerful knockback, which I actually really like. But it wasn't increasing your revive speed? Well, now it will do it uh, by the 10% that was listed. Next, Zealous Blade. Now, this is interesting. You remember that one of the first forays they went into with making it so that weapon skills provide you a benefit even if you don't have the weapon equipped was with Zealous Blade. They added this whole thing where you heal if you light field combo. 
So maybe you pick up the Zealous Blade even if you're on a Staff build because then you can combo somehow or whatever, right? Well, uh, they've changed it. So they didn't like that early experiment. They say this trait no longer heals when combined with a light field or grants 10% bonus damage when wielding a greatsword either. Instead, this trait now gives you 120 power and then an additional 120 power if you've got the greatsword in addition to the skill recharge element. So I think what happened was essentially they played with an idea and then later they clearly settled on the 120-120 split that they've done everywhere else. And now this one's been brought in line as that. The exact comparison of a 10% modifier versus 240 power. Uh, I'm not entirely sure off the top of my head. People will definitely be saying in the comments though. Next you've got Eternal Armory. So we've seen lots of spirit weapon buffs consistently. The devs are still going with it. This is the spirit weapon trait. Uh, the men means that they do burning. Some people actually do try this. I don't rate it very highly. But they've just doubled the burn on it. There's now not just one burn stack, but there's two every time they pulse. So that sword, okay. Uh, it does so many packets of damage. Now it's you've just doubled the burning that the sword is doing. That's a lot of extra damage. Of course... If you load all of your damage just into one condition type, it's quite easy to find your opponent removes that. Uh, but in PvE, that's going to be a pretty fun build, actually, I think. Because it's very rare that things actually cleanse, let alone transfer it into Aegis or whatever. So, I think it's pretty fun, and I'm interested in looking uh, into that. In fact, more than the Dragon Hunter stuff. Next, Retribution. Just a straight-up nerf. It's no longer giving you Ferocity. Radiant Power. This now instead gives you plus 150, so it's shuffled a little bit. Pure of Sight. So this is the trait that means the uh, for Dragon Hunter, the further away they are, the more damage you do. And it's got that interesting synergy with like the juicy True Shots. Remember, True Shot got buffed to 1500 range recently, right? Well now, check it out. Pure of Sight. It now scales dynamically based on distance from the target. It used to cap at like 13%. Now it caps at 15 So it's slightly stronger at the max range now. But it's just using the dynamic scaling. And finally, Spear of Justice. We started with the Spear of Light. We're finally at the Spear of Justice. And they say that the skill has been updated so that the tether doesn't fail so often against world bosses. I wonder if that was brought to their attention because of all the world boss events that have been going into the game recently. Uh, I wasn't even really aware that, that was a bit of a problem. But you want your spear tethered while you're in PvE against a world boss or whatever because that's a big modifier for you, right? And that's a part of the Dragon Hunter experience, right? Landing the tether, hooking someone with a spear and then doing all your other damage. So it would be pretty bad to miss and hopefully it will a little bit less. That's it for Guardian. Like I said at the start, it's just kind of shuffles. I'm not surprised though because uh, myself, I actually said I feel like a lot of Guardian stuff feels really on the level to me at the moment. And we'll just have to see how these damage shuffles go. Not the craziest stuff, not the biggest new toy box for us, but there you have it. Alright, now Mesmer. Mesmer went through a lot of stuff this patch. Sadly, many of the really oppressive and frustrating things that I want nerfed are completely untouched. And for that reason, I'm really not very happy with this section. But there are some significant change-ups, especially for Chrono players out there. It sounds like there's a lot of new art, there's new skills, there's a lot of fun things to look at and think about. So it will definitely be a flavorful experience next patch. I just don't think that this one's targeted the things that really needed to be targeted. In fact, for some of this, I'm scratching my head as to their justification for it whatsoever. Let's go into it. Now, Mesmer, in this update, we are revisiting the Chronomancer specialization and adding a trade-off in the form of new Chronomancer Shatters. So, these Shatters behave differently than core Mesmer Shatters and gain extra properties in exchange for requiring more planning to use properly. Furthermore, we're reducing the number of Shatters from 5 back down to 4 in order to match the other Mesmer specialization. So no more F5 on uh, Chrono. I've also over on Mirage, Dune Cloak is also undergoing a minor rework to make it more utility focused in order to differentiate it from the more offense focused Infinite Horizon, which is one of their Grandmasters, and the defense focused Elusive Mind, another one of their Grandmasters. So there's actually a lot to talk about and really interesting ideas the devs are going with. Let's see what they've got. Change number one, illusions in general. The illusion counter that tracks clones on the user interface, they're talking about the three little dots you see when you're a Mesmer, uh, now de decrements immediately when a shatter is cast rather than waiting for the clones to be destroyed. So currently in game, if I have three clones up and I press mind rack, 
the dots will stay lit up. All of three of my clones will wander all the way over to the bristleback. And then one will blow up and one of the dots will disappear. And then another one will get close enough and blow up and another dot will disappear. And then finally the third. And it feels kind of like laggy or whatever. I guess the devs realized that from the Mesmer's perspective, you kind of don't really care at all when exactly they blow up, right? You just want to know, is it okay to generate new clones already yet? And, well, now that will be a little bit more evident on the UI. So that's a positive change, but it doesn't really change anything. Next, Speed of Sand. So this is for Mirages, which is when you dodge roll, you get super speed as well as Mirage Cloak. Well, now, instead of getting super speed, instead, the Mirage Cloak itself is just giving you 66% movement speed. So, what does that mean and why have the devs done that? Well, what they've done is decoupled the specific mechanic of super speed from just being able to move faster while in your dodge roll. And I think the reason they've done that is to break various rune interactions and other synergies they might be looking at elsewhere on the class and on other classes going forwards. So, they're just trying to keep that pure. They've got rid of that. I actually was thinking of just getting rid of the whole super speed idea and movement all, all together on Mirage. I think that would even be fine. But uh, they've kept it in. It's just raw movement speed you're getting here now. I wonder how that would feel with both. Would they stack? Probably not. Next, Spatial Surge. This is the Greatsword Auto. And if you've been looking at the other sections of today's video, you'll know what's coming here. This skill now scales dynamically based on distance rather than using distance thresholds. Yep, so that's the same as with many of these other things. It's now not going to have a clunky tooltip and whatever. It will just gradually scale up and down based on how far away you're striking. Next, Shatters. Now, this is where we're going to be kind of excited and also kind of scratching our head. Let's see this. Mesmers who are using the Chronomancer specialization now receive new Shatters that replace the four core Shatters. Chronomancer Shatters require at least one clone to activate. And unlike core shatters, they do not replace the shatter effect, uh, sorry, replicate the shatter effect on the Mesmer itself. All right, so story time, if you guys haven't followed Mesmer development, way back when the game first came out, this was how, how all the shatters worked. A shatter had to blow up a clone. It had to shatter a clone to have an effect. And then a trait was in the game called Illusory Persona, which meant that whenever you use a shatter, you yourself, the actual physical player, the char casting the spell or whatever, you counted as a clone if you took that trait on that line. And that was a really cool idea for a trait, but it was also very strong. It was kind of like the Mesmer's fast hands or, uh, you know, in trickery as a thief getting that extra initiative. It just felt so, so, so huge. So, uh, what they eventually did was said, well, why not just make it baseline? And Mesmer's got that luxury. You may be wondering why Warriors never got fast hand baseline and so on. I guess those are discussions for another time. But ever since then, Illusory Persona has just always been on every Mesmer. No matter what build you are, you count as your own clone. It's been an interaction in the game that obviously has enabled various builds and playstyles, especially Power Shatter playstyles, and that any Mesmer knows all about and has to think about. But I've never actually liked, because I've never thought it was very intuitive. I think it breaks the fundamental idea of what shattering is, right? So, uh, the devs are essentially giving Chronos totally new shatters to say... As a Chrono, you no longer get this benefit. You're back to vanilla, and you have to... Remember at the top here, they say careful planning? What that careful planning basically means is it, you're going back to vanilla, and you have to <laughs> think about creating clones properly before you can shatter. There's no free random quarter of a second distort at the perfect time without anything built up. You have to be careful. And so this does actually have an impact on certain things. There's a very bursty... Uh, chrono build out there right now that kind of relies on proccing one of your mind racks off of yourself and now you're not going to be getting that so it does cull a lot of this stuff away uh, so you do need clones and that is the trade-off basically all of these new skills and the names of them and the icons presumably they have and stuff yeah it's a bit of flavor fun but it's really all just about building that trade-off there so let's see what they've done and you'll notice the new shatters for chrono are therefore pretty much exactly the same as the old ones. And that's kind of boring, but here you go. So the new mind rack is called Split Second. This skill re replaces and inherits traits from mind rack. So any trait that would bump mind rack now bumps Split Second. 
So all the interactions are the same, right? Fundamentally, there's not dips too. You're not going to use this in a very different way. The skill deals damage for each clone shattered and additional bonus damage when striking slowed foes. So standard mind rack does more damage the more you shatter. This one seems to be more about actually hitting something with slow on it. Re so slight tweak. Rewinder. This uh, re replaces and inherits traits from Cry of Frustration. It deals damage and inflicts confusion, just like Cry of Frustration, for each clone shattered. And additionally, this one will recharge itself by five seconds for each clone you shatter. Now, this one's actually really interesting to me because with the way that Mesmer is currently set up, you can turbocharge Cry of Frustration. You can really put a lot of stuff on Cry of Frustration to make it hit like a truck. And it sounds like as a chrono going in that angle, you can spam it pretty fast as well, better than other Mesmer variants. So the, the, the twist on this one for Rewinder, I'm really excited about. Next, and I'm definitely looking to play a build on that. Time Sync. This skill replaces and inherits traits from Diversion. It dazes foes, so it's exactly like Diversion, but also applies two seconds of slow for each clone shattered. So you're not relying on traits now to get that slow out, and obviously that then has your synergy over here. Um, so, yeah, I assume then that the new trait, which is Diversion stuns instead, Time Sync will now stun instead, and so on. Uh, and lastly, you do not have Distortion. Distortion is not on Chrono necessarily because look, Continuum Split is your F4. It says this now replaces Distortion for the F4 slot instead of taking F5, but it does actually give you Distortion for a second when cast. Your duration has been rescaled based on the number of clones from three to four and a half and then six seconds. The skill now specifies that it cannot be reset by other Mesmer skills. So this is going to change things a lot because you're not going to have a tiny little continuum split to sp spam out one skill and then quickly refresh, right? You're going to be in C split for a while, right? At least three seconds when you trigger it, up to six. Uh, and what this also means is you're not going to get any long-term distortion as a Chronomancer anymore. You will only ever get one second. Even if you triple clone Shatter, you're still at just one second of distortion. The rest is all continuum split. But there's an interesting thing going on here, guys, where by bundling distortion and continuum split together anyway, it's kind of a non-issue because if you take a ton of damage in continuum split, when continuum split ends, you just get all that health back anyway because you rewind time and you go back to the point before you took all the damage in the first place. So, you know, the fact that you're not getting a super long distortion for your entire continuum split duration in some scenarios is kind of, you know, they help one another out. Uh, but yeah, so there you go. Chrono really gets some changes. Four new skills there and how that's going to affect all the PvE chronos. Once again, it's another one of those patches where you're going to be having fun with that. Let's look at the other skills here before I linger on this section for too long. Uh, Signal of Illusions, just a skill description change, nothing major. Mimic, it seems like there was something abusive about this because their change here is that the boon that allows faster skill recharge, basically the effect you apply to yourself when you cast Mimic, which essentially is a skill that lets you double cast skills, guys. The boon that allows faster skill recharge is now removed prematurely if you enter on exit or transform or use a mount. I'm guessing people were using tonics or mounts or something to uh, manipulate this in some interesting way that they get lots of mimics out. I don't know. Sounds like an exploit -y kind of tweak to me. Maybe you guys can have some clarifying comments in the uh, uh, comments down below. For Veil, they fixed a bug that meant that sometimes the visuals never lined up with where it actually was. And the exact same on Temporal Curtain. So nothing too exciting there. Now let's look at June Cloak. Now June Cloak I really like as a Guild Wars 1 nerd. Because when Nightfall came out for Guild Wars 1 and Dervish was added, we had this really interesting Sand Shards build and the Dervish and the J June Cloaks, which Mirage was actually recapturing and nodding back to. Uh, it's one of the Grandmasters that I genuinely believe if ArenaNet appropriately nerfed a lot of the busted stuff on Mirage, eventually everyone would be over on Sand Shard Dune, Dune Cloak builds. Uh, but here's a, a tweak to it already. Without nerfing the other stuff, here's a tweak to Dune Cloak. They say it's been reworked. It's got new visuals, so I'm looking forward to seeing that when the patch comes in. And now, would it mean it will trigger at the end of your Mirage Cloak instead of instantly? As it currently stands, it splash out bleeds, do a bit of damage that reads as empathy in the combat log, by the way, which is very cool. And conditions last longer on bleeding foes, right? So it's just kind of spammy condition stuff. Not very fun. Now it has an animation. It triggers at the end of Mirage Cloak. So I'm guessing it just makes your Mirage Cloak look different. And then it's damage. The baseline damage has been increased by 100%. And instead of inflicting bleeds, it's removing boons 
AOE on five targets around you, giving them to you. Now that is a very mesmery idea. It no longer feels at all what it was themed around looking towards Guild Wars 1, but I like the idea of dodging on lots of enemies and suddenly I have all of those boons. Imagine we're in fractals and, you know, the targets have got the um, instability up where they've given themselves protection and fury and stuff and I just kind of dodge on them and, oh, look, now I have all their boons. It's an interesting thought. Of course, in the competitive modes as well, that's going to be interesting. So, yes, uh, pretty much a new trait altogether there with the new version of Dune Cloak. The double flat damage as well opens up some interesting power implications for it too, which I'm also curious about. Though the damage on it right now is very low, so I don't know whether 100% is even that much, but we'll see. Auspicious Anguish, fairly new. What it currently does is you can distort, and then when you next get CC'd, it instantly gives you distortion back. And they only recently added it to the game. A lot of players don't run it because if you're playing Chaos in that way, it tends to be better to take the Staff trait that's there instead. And there's not many places where you'd really care for this. But it's being reworked. I think the reason it's being reworked in this patch is because of the new Continuum Shift. What it would currently mean is if you took both of these as the patch would come in, you would be able to double C-split when you got CC'd, right? By playing an auspicious anguish continue, uh, chronomancer, right? And you could reverse time more regularly after you get crowd controlled. And I guess the dev thought that that was a little bit too strong. So it's been reworked preemptively and they say this, it now causes up to two damaging conditions on the Mesmer to be converted into boons whenever the Mesmer gains distortion or becomes disabled. So that's the rework, and I actually think that's a super, super so strong trait. Every time I get CC'd in any way, I'm Condi transferring. One of the main things Mirage is doing at the moment is spamming Daze Mantra on one another and Chaos Storm Dazes uh, on condition damage builds. And well, now you can just pick up Auspicious Anguish and all the conditions they're putting on you, you're Im immediately flipping around. So they put the Daze Mantra on you and immobilize you. You instantly auspicious anguish would flip that Im uh, immobilization into resistance and you'd cleanse another thing on top. This is mental. It's really strong uh, and it's accessible as well. Uh, you know, a lot of those guys are running chaos anyway and now they maybe just swap off of the, um, the staff trait so they're running with a little bit less protection. This is really crazy and let's not forget as well if you combine this with an inspiration style mesmer which gives themselves lots of mini distortions whenever they pop signets. It's like you can pop a random utility skill, give yourself distortion, convert conditions. Remember, this is not cleansing conditions, it's converting them. I don't know why the devs keep doing this. This is like such unnecessary extra layering to the, the mindset for balancer, right? This could just be a cleanse, but it's a convert. So, wow, uh, a rework I'm pretty sure was to do with this has actually added something very strong as far as I see it right now. There's no ICD listed. Next, you've got Flow of Time. So this is your Chrono Alacrity. The Alacrity per clone shattered has been increased from one to one and a half seconds. Seize the moment. The quickness per clone, if you're taking that, is gone from 1.5 to two. And Master of Fragmentation, due to changes to the Chrono Shatters, this trait no longer slows when you use Continuum Shift. Instead, it adds projectile reflection to distortion in the same way. So you're gonna miss out on that. This is obviously the trait that means your shatters are like improved, right? And uh, yeah, so you don't get slow there. It's just the reflect. My first interpretation of this was that the Chronomancer would be constantly reflecting projectiles while he is time shifted. But no, it's only for the distort period of that, which will only ever be one second. So yeah, there's quite a laundry list of things to talk about on Mesmer. I'm genuinely lukewarm about it though, because I feel like really important things to be targeted weren't at all. And I see something else very strong, it seems. My instinct has just arrived. So, we'll see how it goes. Necromancer is next on the list. Now, at the head of this balance preview, the devs suggested some really exciting stuff for Core Shroud, didn't they? Well, I'm not really sure that there's too much exciting for Core Shroud. Uh, in fact, I'm a little underwhelmed on this section, but let's see what we've got. Necromancer. They say, while Reapers were designed to be durable frontline fighters, the Soul Eater trait is providing a little too much survivability, so we're removing the ability for this trait to heal while in a shroud. We're also making some changes to core Necromancer Death Shroud skills. These changes are aimed at improving the uptime of shroud skills to put them more in line with their elite specialization counterparts. 
Okay, so let's go through the list and see what they go with. First of all, Death Shroud in general, they fixed an issue with the UI where it looked like Dark Path. Dark Path itself. So Dark Path is skill two in Shroud. Currently, it fires a little projectile out. If it hits a target, it teleports to the, you to them. Uh, it chills them, it bleeds, and uh, you can trait it to convert co uh, conditions. It feels like a really weighty skill, very uh, identifiable sound effect. You guys will know this one. Well, they've changed it into two separate skills now. And this is the biggest change. Updated the icon for the skill. Reduced the recharge from 15 to just 8. So almost half to the recharge. And this is just going to be a ton of recharge changes, okay? They've reduced the chill duration from 5 to 3. Which I think is fair because too much chill can feel very oppressive. And they say this. The skill now damages, chills, and inflicts bleeding aoe on all foes in an area rather than only damaging and bleeding the first foe hit the projectile that gets fired now travels in a straight line rather than following the slope of the ground and what they're saying here is no if you fire it on a slight hill it's not going to just fall into the ground constantly and fail all the time this used to work really wonkily with the z-axis and fall down cliffs and things and i think that's what they're changing here um, they say though that the skill no longer instantly shadow steps you to the target Instead it will flip over to another skill called dark pursuit When the projectile hits and you can choose to press dark pursuit the follow-up skill to dark path Shadow steps the necromancer to the first foe struck and increases the recharge of dark path itself Back by another eight seconds up to its you know beyond its original 15 okay Dark Pursuit can be cast for three seconds after the path projectile hits a target. So I actually kind of like all this. I could have imagined Arena Net of today would have loaded a ton of effects onto Dark Pursuit and said, oh, and now if you do the teleport, you get corrupts and you get this and you get this and you this, but they haven't. What I am interested in is the trait that modifies Shroud 2. Does that mean you get a corrupt on the initial impact and a corrupt on the shadow step? If both proc that corrupt trait, that's pretty fun. And I actually think that is a reasonable buff to Core Shroud. So I kind of hope to see that. Even without that trait proccing on the two separate skills, it's already pretty huge that you now have an AoE corrupt on Core Shroud too, right? That feels pretty scourgy and the radius could be very comfortable for it as well. But yeah, essentially what this is all doing is it's saying, all right, you don't have to make yourself super vulnerable anymore by blowing into melee whenever you are using Core Shroud. You can actually free cast from the side meaningfully in Core Shroud. Sure, the four and the five, you're not going to get too much. And Doom, you're going to lose a bit of value. But hey, look, you can get some Doom Fire Autos going and you can actually AoE condition pressure without having to port in. So it is a nice quality of life improvement. Just nothing crazy major. Then life transfer, the skill four. They've dropped the recharge from 40 to 25 seconds and tainted shackles, the five, they've dropped the recharge from 40 to 30. So let's pause here. Obviously recharge drops are just useful. They mean that every time you go into shrouds, you're not gonna be looking at loads of stuff still in cooldown and not get much value. You're now actually being able to cast stuff more regularly. But we can look a little bit deeper into this. Tainted Shackles, for example, that is reveal. I know that Boots kind of dismissed it a little bit, but that's much more regular reveal and much more regular reveal uptime, which does help you to keep pesky uh, invisible foes away from you. I kind of like that. Uh, and this one is particularly interesting to me because of transfusion and blood magic and just the ability to be able to heal more regularly around you and uh, teleport bodies more regularly on a core necromancer because the cooldown is so much lower. You need to compare this to like Scourge's garish pillar, right? And well, dropping the cooldown kind of makes sense here. And if you're looking for more with Core Shroud, I understand you, but that's actually it. No, really, because now we're looking at underwater. And I like that the devs are looking at underwater, but it just feels a bit underwhelming, right? So Dark Water, this is your skill two, that's like the really strong AOE field. Reduce the recharge by about half. Reduce the pulses as well, and the duration as well. But there you go, it's more accessible. So the kind of play style of flip into Shroud, cast the spell, leave, and then go back in and cast the spell, leave. It just, this is kind of a flow thing to me. Wave of Fear, reduce the recharge by five seconds. This seems so like careful and deliberate and moderate, and it's an underwater CC skill, but the devs seem to really be trying to be careful with it. So there you go. Gathering Plague, this is the one that grabs all the condies onto you. Uh, again, it's a five second cooldown drop. That's it. That's your core shroud stuff. So we'll see how that all goes. 
I don't think it's going to be any massive rocking of the boat. But maybe the game doesn't need too many massive rocks of the boat. Uh, Necromancer, a bit like Guardian, was one of those ones where I felt, you know, was about on par. Uh, then we do have two other changes. You've got Unholy Martyr, where they fixed a bug that caused it to not properly clean up some Death Shroud stuff. And then Soul Eater, which is the Reaper trait that came in very recently. The trait no longer heals while Shroud Life Force replaces health. Uh, and yeah, they mentioned this at the top here. I actually remember, I don't know whether it got cut out of the video in the end, but I had quite a lengthy discussion with Boots on the previous balance with Boots as this trait came in and I was really excited and saying, oh, this is really strong. And Boots kind of sat me down and said, is it really that strong? And we did kind of a, a slow maths bit, which is why I think it might have got cut out of the video in the end. Um, but here, I, you know, I kind of listened to Boots. I didn't really think twice about the trait anymore. But here it seems the devs did think it was too strong and they've actually removed it now. Uh, or that element. So there you have it. That's it for Necromancer. Not a big section, but there it is. All right, the Ranger section. Now, I'm really happy with this one. There were certain elements of Ranger that I felt were really strong and wanted to see some change with, and the devs seem to have gone with exactly those changes. So, really happy about this one. Uh, and there's a, a littering of buffs in here as well that hopefully will keep Ranger players happy and find that nice middle ground. So let's see what they've gone with. In this update, we've made some reductions to tone down the strength of some Soul Beast PvP and World vs. World builds. While we believe the builds and play styles have a solid place in the game, and we don't want to take them out of play, certain elements are just a bit too far over the edge. The skill Sikkim is providing a damage modifier that is significantly higher than any other single persistent bonus damage increase in the game. It's 40%. So we're reducing the bonus to match other similar skills in a competitive setting. The reduction only occurs while merged with your pet, and it's only in PvP and World vs. World. We're also reducing access to the unblockable effect provided by some skills and traits in order to create more opportunities for others. So in some of my suggestions for Ranger, I actually wanted to leave Sikkim alone. I, I, I kind of like the fantasy of the 40% on there. And I really think that Sikkim's only enabled because of all the inherent quality of life Rangers can pick up elsewhere. It's pretty much a dead utility skill just for pressure, right? So if the class wasn't as loaded with quality of life as it is, you, they, you wouldn't be able to run that anyway. But they've gone with the Sikkim change, the more simple uh, difference. And yeah, there's some interesting uh, buffs as well. So let's have a look. First of all, long range shot. As we see so often in this video, this skill now scales damage dynamically based on distance rather than using distance thresholds. So it will just, just like we saw with the great sword autos for Mesmer. Then a very interesting one that unfortunately I don't think we have full information on and I'm excited to see how it works. Point blank shot. This skill now scales knockback distance dynamically between a range of 100 and 600 based on the distance from the target. So it sounds, what I wanted was this exact change for this skill, but I wanted it to be that if you are really far away casting it, it wasn't a hard CC at all. There's something fundamentally balked about that, I feel. But it sounds like it will always be a hard CC. It's just it's not going to knock back very far. Realistically, I'm not sure how much that matters. Um, but it is something, and yeah, I think it fits the idea of the skill a lot better now that it genuinely knocks back a lot further the closer you are, and it's got that dynamic scaling. I like it. We could kind of predict this was coming based on the previous patch and the change of engineer, and there it is. Next, you have a cool buff. It's to Barrage. Barrage to me is like the iconic classic ranger ability. It's such a cool skill, but it's always felt a bit underwhelming in Guild Wars 2. I must be honest. Uh, and well, it gets a buff here. So they've reduced the recharge by a full 10 seconds. You can barrage way more regularly now. That's huge, guys. They've lowered the cripple duration by half a second on each pulse. But then not only can you spam this thing way more now, they've increased the damage by 25%. So it pressures significantly harder as well. So some fun uh, bonus to Barrage, which was a skill I think had some wiggle room. You know, the Soul Beasts and Rangers in general, they're getting some nerfs here, but they get this little pick up. Uh, and also a little bit of fun here as well. The damage floaters are going to keep ticking up instead of showing separate packets of damage. So you'll be able to see if your barrage hit an individual dude for like 12k or something. Or you manage to completely blow up a boss for however much because of the barrage. So yeah, I actually am alright with the barrage uh, improvement. And there's some interesting applications of barrage. Obviously in World vs. World in various areas of PvE where you can shoot over walls and things. So yeah. 
Next, we've got uh, over to Druid, Sublime Conversion. So this is the staff skill that drops that line, and any projectiles going through it just sort of evaporate into happy little water. Uh, well, this now has an added bonus that any ally walking through the wall gets given regeneration. Just a nice little thing that they've thrown on top of that there. Uh, that maybe counterbalances a pretty huge nerf for staff. I gen this is more of a Heart of Thorns balance thing, but I genuinely think one of, my th one of the most loaded, busted skills in the entire game is Ancestral Grace. This is Staff 3. This is the thing that turns you into the Wisp, moves you an enormous distance, uh, an incredible speed, and it evades the whole time as well. Well, the devs have decided that it is OP, and it no longer evades attacks. They've even bumped the recharge up baseline by another two seconds. Now, I know what you're thinking. Holy goddamn, why do they keep nerfing Druid? And I feel that way as well. Dru Druid has taken enough of a beating, so it's amazing to still see these coming in. I do still think that, irrespective of all the broader Druid nerfs, this skill was still loaded, and I'm really happy to see that it doesn't evade anymore. I am. It just feels a bit icky in the general space of the game right now, right? Though, with the cooldown um, nerf here, they did add a little bit of a buff. If you're healing someone else, the recharge is reduced. So, I think the play of this skill will feel a little bit more fun now, in that you're, you're using it to run away... And you actually look to see, oh, is there an NPC I can cast this on as I do it? Because then I'll get it back quicker later. Or is there somehow I can pair off with someone in the roads to, you know, get that extra value out of the skill? So, uh, in a vacuum, I think this is a really nice change. I like it. I think it sounds good. But at the same time, I am totally on board with, wow, do we really have to keep nerfing Druid? Uh, but there you have it. Call of the Wild. Uh, this is a whole section on Unblockable. A lot of the unblockable access on Soul Beast is going away or being reduced. So, if you currently are a Soul Beast, you merge with your pet and you cast Warhorn 5, guess what? You become unblockable. You can swap to your uh, longbow and point blank shot someone out of a shield block or whatever and go with some crazy damage. The unblockable boon provided by this skill now will only last for three attacks within five seconds instead of all attacks for four seconds. So that's a significant nerf there. It means that you will only get three very precise strikes to break through whatever blocks are, and then you're done. And consider what this means when you're against projectile mitigation. Now, swelling winds are threats to you once again. Firebrand bubbles are threats to you once again. Sanctuaries, all these things, they are threats to you once again. This is a significant culling of the Soul Beast experience if they were relying on the Warhorn 5, which admittedly not too many were, but for good housekeeping, they've done it everywhere. So here as well... The trait that did this for your pet. I mean, you couldn't be merged and pet swap to proc the trait to get the lesser thing anyway, so whatever. But they've done it here as well. And the lesser one only lasts two attacks for five seconds instead of all for three. Uh, we'll skip down a little bit here as well to the bottom change, which is probably my favorite change of the entire thing. It's still on the unblockable theme, and this is the important one. Unstoppable Union. This is an easy-to-pick-up adept trait for any soul beast that gives them a stun break, easy-to-access stun break, and made them unblockable. It was the main way that enabled a lot of the crazy burst damage that was coming from these longbow builds. And well, check it out. Unstoppable Union. This trait no longer grants unblockable at all. It's completely gone. So if you're looking for unblockable, you're looking for it from the Warhorn combo. And now suddenly this stuff is important and you can see why this is coming with the patch. This no longer gives you unblockable. What a fantastic change. Instead, they do get another perk. It's removing movement impairing conditions in addition to its stun break. So it's an escape potential skill now. And I think it is valuable for that. And I, I think even just as a stun break alone. But, you know, you're ripping a mob and all these things to be able to get out. I think it's nice. No unblockable instant access. You're utilizing Warhorn. You're playing around with these things. And they're significantly cold away. That is a huge hit to some of these extremely oppressive playstyles here. And I think it was really necessary since a lot of the reflects and mirror up time things on other classes went away. Um, these things were very dominated, and I, I think this is a brilliant, brilliant change. Going uh, to the rest of the Ranger stuff here, we have some interesting buffs uh, for the Frost Trap. Frost Trap now pulses more times and does double flat damage in PvE. So you actually get a flat damage trap for once on Ranger. Would you believe it? You don't have to go Dragon Hunter for this. Frost Trap already did pretty good flat damage. It was the highest of all of them. Now it's hitting a whole extra time, right? So you can look at this 
Well, hold on. It's only as a 20% damage increase, right? And then all of the hits are doubled on top of that. The chill duration goes down a bit. They also fixed a bug that prevented the ice field for lasting the full duration. I'm not sure how regularly that hit or what that was all about, but there you have it. Next, you've got Sikkim. So yeah, Sikkim is nerfed only in PvP and World vs. World, only while merged. It's kind of one of those cheaty nerfs that they've done. A little bit like how Doomfire is secretly nerfed when you become a Scourge. It doesn't really make any sense and there's no, uh, you know, intuitive... Uh, elements to the game that would show you that it just kind of happens in the background and then you mouse over the trait and you realize it's written in blue and it's changed well here you have it so they still allow you to do 40% modifier for your pet and I love those play styles right at least controlling those play styles I like the idea of turbocharging my owl or my tiger or whatever or my gazelle and really trying to blow someone up with sick on a core ranger but uh, when you're merging now, it's down from 40 to 25 so it's still a big modifier okay and it's still doing the reveal but I think that this, in addition with the unblockable change, this is enough. This is what I wanted for Soul Beast, and I think it's incredible. They are very clear that damage bonus for pets remain unchanged, and they even fixed a bug that caused the skill to not grant the listed movement speed bonus. I don't know how regularly that happened, but yeah, don't forget, you get to run around quicker as well. Next, a change to one wolf pack. They fixed a bug that could cause it to fail if a player was jumping. I don't know if that means the soul beast is jumping, one wolf pack stops striking, or if uh, a target it's shooting at is jumping. Obviously in PvE, none of the bosses you're fighting jump, none of the enemies you're fighting jump. So this is really just a world versus world or PvP thing. Uh, but I didn't know which, whether it's actually the caster or the, uh, the person being struck. Either way, they fixed it. Over on Druid, Verdant Etching. Of course, this is your glyph trait. Apparently, it wasn't working with a new glyph, Glyph of Stars, uh, which I want to see. They, I want to see buffs because I love the Glyph of Stars. I think it was really cool, but it's not good enough, is it? Really? I don't know. Are people running that a lot in places, and I just don't know? I want to see that be buffed. I want Rangers to really have a good uh, feeling when they're using that. Anyway, it's now interacting with the trait correctly. Light on your feet. This is the trait that means when you dodge, you get a damage bonus. Well, now um, if you use Quick Shot, which is like a mini little dodge, it will proc the trait too. So that's a nice little thought, and they add that on there. Twice as vicious. This is back to Soul Beast. This is when you disable someone. It's a minor, so every Soul Beast has this. When you manage to disable someone in any way, you get a buff of 5% damage and condi damage. Uh, but it never lasted very long in the past. Only 4 seconds? Now it's up to 10. That feels more manageable. And it's a little something for the Soul Beasts since they've lost their unblockable, obviously. And then second skin has actually been nerfed as well here. Uh, Soul Beasts are now more vulnerable to condition damage in PvP. Not World vs. World or PvE, just PvP. It's gone from 33% reduced condition damage to 20. This is obviously more about the side noting experience with the second skin. But uh, there you go, they go with that nerf as well. So yeah, I think they targeted important stuff. Uh, a lot of the changes that I really wanted and then some more, to be honest, they've gone with. I really worked very hard when I was thinking about Ranger to not have to hit Sikkim in any big way. But the devs just went for it, and I think that's pretty cool. Obviously, it feels kind of bad to be a ranger, but I do still think the play, the play style is viable. It's just not ludicrously loaded. You have to be careful about high mobility, 1500 range specs. There has to be some counterplay somewhere, and projectile mitigation is it. Those are just the facts. Moving on to Revenant, this is a section I'm really excited about. There are some very clever targeted nerfs on important things and also really fun new toys. I've been saying it over and over again, I want to see Malik's buffs. Well, there's basically two new Malik skills in the game as of next patch. Sounds very fun and I can't wait to get my hands on this stuff. So let's jump in. Revenant, when we reworked Sword 5 from its old version, Grasping Shadow into Death Strike. We also carried over the slow and chill conditions that it was inflicting. However, since Death Strike is a damage skill rather than a control skill like Grasping Shadow was, we are now removing this component because it muddies the new purpose of the skill. This is a brilliant thing they're saying here. Uh, also, Death Strike is just such a loaded, ridiculous skill. It doesn't need all this other stuff, right? We'll talk about that in a second. Similarly, we're also reworking both Embrace the Darkness, a Malik skill, and Unyielding Anguish, a Malik skill, that both act as pulsing area of effect with the intent of better differentiating when they should be used. Embrace the Darkness is being focused on inflicting torment, while Unyielding Anguish is being revamped, becoming a setup skill that gathers enemies, and it's been renamed to Call to Anguish. Beyond these changes, we're also scaling up skills and traits that look like they were just marginally out of play, and reducing some might generation in PvP. 
Night Generation Tut being targeted is an excellent thing, is what everyone's been asking for. Uh, so let's see. First of all, impossible odds. Instead of pulsing super speed, it now simply increases your move speed by 50%. So we've seen this all over the place in this release. They don't like having super speed. They're just baking move speed into the various effects. Uh, I'm not, again, 100% sure why they're doing this, except they're just trying to decouple random super speed synergies on other things. Maybe they have plans for super speed going forward. One thing I do just like about this is now you're not going to see multiple different effects loading up on people's boon and buff bars because super speed comes in at the same time as another thing. Same thing with the Mirage change earlier. So I just like this. Also, very importantly, in PvP only, there's been a 19% damage reduction on the secondary strikes of impossible odds. That's a significant nerf, and it helps to bring Rev down from the godlike damage level it's at right now. So really nice change. Very happy with that. Hardening persistence. So this is a herald trait. Uh, that means the more you are channeling energy, or the more pips you're spending, you get damage reduction. Well, they've just buffed it across the whole game from 1 to 1.5. I really like the idea of playing like a tanky Jarless Herald. I've got one set up that I run around on on Winter's Day to look like a dwarf. And yay, this one's been buffed a bit further. All those damage reduction, uh, I like them. Uh, next, we've got Focus Siphoning. So this is the Devastation Minor trait that means you lifesteal as you're striking. And it's a tiny amount of life still. Tiny amount of damage, tiny amount of healing. Like barely anything and hardly scales with power and healing power. Well, now they've been increased by 400% power scaling on the damage and 400% healing scaling on the healing. Okay, so they actually scale. The thing is, you're going to read 400% and think that's crazy. If you look at the current modifier on it, it's like 0 0.0004 or something, right? So increasing by 400% isn't even that much of a change. But they did it. And I'm happy to see that because stuff that barely scales at all just isn't fun. Next, they have an underwater change, as we've seen several in this patch and I have a lot of respect for. I like that the devs are looking at this. Uh, Spear of Anguish, it now scales dynamically based on distance using different distance thresholds. Wherever that's been in the game, they've changed, so I like to see that. Next, another really important nerf here. Look at this, Notoriety. This is massive amounts of might generation, and it's also might augmentation on the class, making might more important for power instead of condition damage. Well, they've reduced the might duration by half, and they've reduced the number of stacks that are being applied by one. These are PvP-only changes. I think I made this exact recommendation in a recent video, so I am over the moon to see this exact thing has ended up happening. They even went a lot further than I was thinking. So, yeah, way less might. And uh, I think that's very, very important, and I love it. Uh, next, you've got a Renegade buff. Ice Razor's Ire increased damage by 30%. I don't think this is really meaningful in any way, but there it is. I'm still waiting on some kind of big change for the spirits at some point, maybe. Elemental Blast, they have a change uh, for PvE. It's a buff. So they reduced the recharge from 12 to 10 and incre uh, fixed uh, an incorrect radius to tip. I'm guessing the change of 12 to 10 is so that you can more reliably utilize it in a nice flowing way every time you go back into Glint. I'm guessing this is the idea. Correct me if I'm wrong. But at 12, it might have felt a little bit clunky. At 10, obviously, every 9 seconds, you're doing your Legend Swap. Or every 10 seconds, you're doing your Legend Swap. It's, it feels like it's it lines up nicely, right? Um, next, uh, and it's probably raid rotation oriented. That's my take of this. So this is a trait from the new Herald rework that whenever you use a consume... You know, do you remember they added the whole new category of skill consumes when you actually eat up these energy cost upkeep skills? Uh, whenever you use one, you heal, okay? Uh, but it had a three second ICD on it, which felt really awkward and weird. I don't want to have to pace out each of my consumes for three. You never take it. Now there is no ICD, so you can burst all those consumes and you get some good sustain. So Rev is losing some of his pressure, but actually gaining sustain if it wants to pick up some of these traits. I do think, I do think that that's meaningful. Especially with the way that you burst a lot of those out when you're in Glint and then you move on. Next, Rapid Flow. This is Invocation that heals you and gives swiftness whenever you spend energy. 50% more healing. Again, resustain. Uh, it, it's competing with a very damage-oriented thing, which is Might on Fury, I think. So it needs to be a compelling choice, and I think that's why it's been buffed. If they can convince some people to take this for the resustain, then obviously that lowers rev pressure in a way, in sort of a roundabout way. Uh, Shackling Wave, this is Sword 4. In the header, they talked about Sword 5. Well, here, Sword 4 is getting hit as well in PvP and World vs. World. Also, an obscenely powerful skill. We saw that it recently had a cooled, uh, sorry, a cast time added to it, which I thought was a really good change on a recent patch. Well, they're still not satisfied. 
20% less damage on Sword 4. Not on the initial strike, but all the, you know, sudden crazy hits that go afterwards. 20% down, that's significant. And don't forget, that's going to compound with the notoriety change, right? And that's going to compound with the impossible odds change, because you'd like combo those together. So it, we're, we're dropping a significant step here, which is good because Rev is so godlike in its damage. Finally, we get to Death Strike, which they've kept as this big, massive skill. It's a skill five on the, on the kit, so you want it to be big and massive, right? It just no longer chills or slows. So you still get Fury, which gives you Might, and you still do billions of damage, and you still port just as fast, and it's still just as unpredictable and quick to trigger and difficult for players to sort of watch for sometimes. But at least if they survive it, they don't necessarily have these extra condies on them. Next, you've got Burst of Strength. So they've reduced the damage of this in World vs. World, so it's the same as PvP. I'm guessing this is to affect hammer stuff, like using Burst of Strength and then getting crazy hammer procs afterwards. They've increased the bonus damage in PvE, though, from 15 to a full 25. So you're looking at a lot more damage in PvE as long as you're using the Burst of Strength there. Then finally, the really exciting bit. Oh my god. So I love all the nerfs so far. And then we get some really interesting changes for Malix. Unyielding Anguish. So let's just remind ourselves, this skill right now is you like jump, you leap to an area, it creates like a field that chills and torments, and you can take the trait that makes the chill turn into more torment, but it's a costly trait to take because the traits are kind of balked. Unfortunately, they've not looked at the traits at all, but the skills. Now, it's a hard CC, and that is massive. No hard CC on Malix has always held it back. Now it has it? It's pretty huge, guys. For all areas of the game, like I'm going to look forward to breaking break bars, and this is going to be brilliant. So, it's been called call to anguish it's a leap finisher skill that you jump to an area and where you land it pulls foes to the center of your landing point and chills them so the torment isn't on there but it would be if you did the trait uh interaction it's not a pulsing a aoe afterwards but this is really nice. The skill has an energy cost of 35, a five second recharge. So the old one you would just spam and spam and spam and spam. This one's gonna be more energy gated and has the five second recharge on it. But this should feel pretty good. You get to jump in, pull everyone together. I'm guessing it's over five targets. And then you can proc your elite. So the elite, this is like the third or maybe even fourth big iteration of the Malix elite skill, all right? And it's always exciting when they change elite. Here we go. This skill is now a mobile dark field. All right, and don't forget we got the dark combo finisher on a recent patch. It now has a recharge. Before it was like you toggle it on, you toggle it off, and it was a cast time, so it was kind of ugly. The skill no longer grants global attribute bonuses. I am sad to see that go. I kind of liked that, uh, even if it wasn't very meaningful. It's no longer unblockable and unblindable. The amount of torment that it applies per pulse is exactly the same, but... If you use a skill that costs energy while channeling the elite, you increase the stacks of torment coming out on the next pulse by two. Guys, that's loads. It currently only pulses one torment. So you're getting triple torment every pulse as long as you're spending energy, i.e. you're using weapon skills and stuff. You're obviously going to get energy drained because it costs energy to, to upkeep, right? But that's huge. That is so cool. That's a lot of torment now. And with a brilliant setup for it on a hard CC, the kit is now a lot more interesting, okay? And it even does a little amount of damage on every pulse too, and I'm interested to see how that ends up feeling. But that means you're going to be breaking ages and stuff. Very interesting. Could it be everything Malix needs? I somehow doubt it. But that's fun for Rev. I like what I see. And uh, there you have it, guys. Uh, I even kind of want to do this maybe comboed with some Herald stuff. And we'll see what we get out of the end of it. So, uh, yeah, I like this section. Probably my favorite bit of the whole balance, honestly. It's, it's closely tied with some of the other professions, but I really love what they did with Rev this patch. I really do. Thief. Wow, Thief. Where do we start? I'm astounded that there's nothing at the header of this balance post talking about Thief because it has got, I think, possibly the craziest, biggest, most substantial changes by a fed clip as well of all the classes this release it's a real wild card there's a lot of stuff going on here an entirely new category of utility skills multiple trait reworks it's kind of insane so let's see what the devs have done and see what we can predict and how we feel about this uh thief in this update we are reworking the shadow arts trait line for thieves 
As a support and survivalist focused line, we wanted to refocus it around stronger themes as well as improve the potency of its minor traits. Many of the more passive traits have been adjusted or rebuilt to have more active effects, while some of the more niche traits like Merciful Ambush, this is the Resurrect one, have been adjusted to have more general use application. Meanwhile, new traits like Shadow Savior and reworked traits like Rending Shade Rending Shade was uh, rip boons, I think, when you strike out of stealth. Will help to provide new ways to approach combat. Thief trap skills are being retired. Now, they use the word retired here, and they say for now. So, there's a suggestion that maybe thieves will get traps back later in an elite spec or something? Uh, they're being retired for now. I mean, it's not like ArenaNet to suggest that future elite spec stuff. So, hey, who knows? But they say replaced by a new type of ability, Preparations. See below for more information on those skills. Now, Guild Wars 1 fans of mine and Guild Wars 1 general players will remember that preparations existed in Guild Wars 1. Rangers in particular had preparations. Well, they're coming to Guild Wars 2. Our new category skills, seriously, guys. So, uh, let's see what they've gone with. And they hit pretty good before we get into all the crazy new stuff with just some intelligent changes. Number one, Daggerstorm. They reduced the casting time of Daggerstorm by 30%. Now, I think the layman might read that as a buff. It's like, oh, you get to do it quicker. The thing is, what that means is for PvP and World vs. World, where it's really frustrating to have an invulnerable thief, essentially invulnerable thief on you for a long time, he can't stall in Daggerstorm for that long. That means several of his cooldowns don't have a chance to get back, and it's all around a bit of a nerf to Daggerstorm. As far as PvE is concerned, where it's really fun to cast Daggerstorm into big groups of mobs, I have to say, uh, they don't want the reduced cast time to actually impact it, so it gets a damage buff. So every less second you get doesn't matter because you did more damage in the period, right? 30% short time, 33% buff. Uh, in re reality, with the way that the projectiles come out, I wonder if that actually perfectly works out, but whatever. Uh, this is what they've done to change Daggerstorm. I think it will feel a little bit less frustrating. It still leaves Thieves with the dream of getting double and triple dagger storms through improvisation. And I think the devs still like the idea of it being a trick. But it's a change and I think a lot of people will be happy with that one. Next, the smoke screen has become a ring instead of a line. We obviously saw the fear wall become a ring recently instead of a line. And didn't we see it on something else as well? It seems the devs just prefer rings for now than lines. I kind of get why they might feel that way. It does look kind of weird to have everyone cluster on a tiny little line in the way that we do now. I'm interested to see what this animation looks like as a ring. When it came to the fear ring, even within the center of the donut, if you will, you still kind of had a nice effect. Is it going to be the same here? It's kind of shadowy everywhere. When it comes to blasting in it, can I blast in the very center and still get stealth combos? Or do I have to sort of walk to the perimeter? I guess we'll see. Uh, Infiltrator Signet, is that a buff? Uh, so this shadow steps when you trigger it, it's gone from 900 to 1200 here. So, you know, chaining that with a shadow step and a seal, you can burst some insane distance with this signet now. Uh, kind of funny. Obviously, the passive of it feels a bit icky, and that would be a thing I'd like to see change on it one day, but there you have it. Uh, and now we have the trap stuff. So get ready, guys. The following skills have been removed. There is no more needle trap, which was pretty mediocre anyway. Kind of fun if you could get... A well-placed needle trap and then a heal skill needle trap and then the, t the p target hits both of them and then you place both again. Maybe you can get something out of it, but really not too great, right? Even when you take panic strike, which meant that the needle trap immobe put even more poison on and stuff. Uh, the trip wire, which was just a knockdown, felt really mediocre. Shadow trap, I actually loved the idea of. Like, the biggest port in the game can move you. What was the distance? 10,000 units or something insane? Really cool idea, but never really worked with terrain and stuff well enough. And then ambush, you know, summon a, 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 a random ally. How often have people really valued the ally you get out of it? This selection of skills really did need help. And I guess the devs may have just decided, look, let's do something totally different and fun. They're being retired for now? Question mark. I guess we'll put a pin in that discussion. But so we have preparations now. Preparations will function in a similar fashion to uh, uh, trap abilities. But they don't fire unless the thief chooses to trigger them. And if you remember, Shadow Trap kind of had that interaction already, right? Like you could place it, you could choose to trigger it back anytime but someone else might do it for you if they stand on it uh, each preparation will have a radius of 240 and will produce a variety of results 
including the introduction of a portal type ability utility that can ferry allies to a location. All right, so let's just remember Portal on Mesmer got nerfed into the ground recently, and now they're giving Portal to Thief. <laughs> it's different, and um, we'll see the specific skill. So these are very much like traps. You're going to put them in an area like a trap. You're going to, like, channel it and cast it, but you have complete control over when it procs, right? So you can create a pitfall. It's not a pitfall trap. It's a pitfall preparation, but it's basically a trap. This new skill marks your current area with controlling magic. And I wonder what all the animations and things are going to look like. This is going to be so cool to do the upcoming video where we get to really look at these things. Controlling magic, readying the location to crush enemies when released. So it flips over into pitfall. And so pitfall will unleash a pitfall on an area. Knocking down foes. So you see it kind of feels like the replacement to tripwire here, right? And delivering constant damage over time. Interesting skill. What springs to my mind is I kind of want to use this along with the Deadeye skill, Shadow Flare. Like, put them both together and actually have, like, point control. Like, pulsing damage on a thief by layering both of these together. Sounds kind of funny. Uh, so, yeah, you get kind of an AoE knockdown and damage over time. Interesting. Uh, then there's Thousand Needles. This marks your area with inhibiting magic, readying the location to poison enemies. The new skill unleashes a hail of needles that immobilizes on impact and repeatedly strikes foes over a short period of time. So Thousand Needles is kind of like the new version of the Needle Trap, right? It's got the Immobile there, which synergizes with Panic Strike for even more poison and then subsequent. It's kind of like they're just going to be better versions of the traps, it feels like, to an extent. Next, though, we get some crazy different ones. Seal Area. This skill marks your area with stifling magic, readying the location to seal enemies in. So this will block projectiles. So you can kind of use it to be safe from all the soul beasts now that aren't so unblockable so readily all the time. And it prevents enemies from entering or leaving. So giving thieves like a ring of warding, like in fact, a sa this is basically a sanctuary, right? If it blocks projectiles and prevents enemies from going in and out, that's sanctuary without the healing element on it, right? I bet the cooldown is way lower than sanctuary as well. I'll tell you what, with the way they do the balance now. Incredible. Um, I mean, obviously, by the way, Thieve Utilities are very hotly contested spots for the roles that they play in, in, in the game. But, uh, you know, there's so many cool areas you could maybe imagine using this out in PvE and so on. Uh, and then finally, the really exciting one, particularly for anyone Conquest-minded, Prepare Shadow Portal. This new skill is obviously the replacement of the, the uh, Shadow Trap, right? Sorry, not the Shadow Trap. What was Yeah, yeah, Shadow Trap. Uh, it will mark your location with Shadow Magic. And you can unleash the shadow magic at your prepared location, creating a one-way portal that you and your allies can take. Allies traveling through the portal are granted stealth as they do it. So it's like a power crept mesmer portal. Imagine having stealth coming out of that. And when they go through it, foes waiting on the other side to ambush and being smart about it get weakened. The skill is split between game modes. So you can let five people through in PvE and World vs. World but only a single ally in PvP. Now, that's a big difference there. The one ally specific there. But honestly, that's still very potent for bailing someone out of a really dangerous engagement or just having a quick rotation or swap. Now, it's only one direction and only one ally. So these are factors to think about. But I mean, what's the duration of it? What's the range of it? Can it be anywhere across the map? I mean, its predecessor, the Shadow Trap, had a ludicrous range. So what's the thinking here behind adding this new tool while so heavily gutting the previous portal? It's been long enough for the developers to realize that they really, really hurt Portal on Mesmer. And this patch has done nothing over in that section to help that one out. And now Thieves get kind of... I mean, I'm really interested in how this works and how this can synergize with like duo cues and fun things. Uh, quite, quite incredible. So a whole new category of skills to look at if you're a thief. And honestly, how long has it been since Thief has had really a new box of tricks? It's been a while. Uncatchable has now become your full damage trait. So you drop the lesser cow drops when you take full damage, which is very minor, by the way. But there you have it. And it reduces full damage. Then we get into even more, right? So trait changes. Deadly Arts, first of all. The Deadly Arts line has had some traits reworked due to the fact that traps are removed. So preparations don't get traits. Uh, they are treated baseline as though they are treated. 
And the devs kind of have a bit of a suggestion in the wording here. They say at this time, maybe these will be nerfed and then you have to trait them later. I don't know. But Deadly Arts therefore is changing because there was actually quite a lot in Deadly Arts that affected traps. So let's quickly run through this. Dagger training uh, allowed you to poison on your dagger autos. Well, it's no longer there. Honestly, I liked sword on Condi playstyles anyway, just for the sword to a move and then poison on that and, and whatnot. But you did find some people dagger auto attack. You could stack a ton of poison on there. And I like the idea of poisoning your daggers from like a thematic uh, perspective. Uh, it was a really fun PvE build as well to play a Condi uh, thief out in the open world with poisonous daggers. And now that's not there. I think that's a bit of a shame. But there you go. They've got rid of that. The trait is super basic now. It's just going to be gain power while you have daggers and gain more if you are actually wielding them. That's it. Great. Trapper's Respite is obviously changing because traps aren't in the game anymore. It's turning into Deadly Ambition. Deadly Ambition is kind of like your replacement for dagger training. Check it out. It's inflict two stacks of poison for three seconds when you hit something. There's an internal cooldown on it of three seconds in PvE. So basically in PvE, you will always have two poison up, right? And then you add Condi duration and it starts to increase, right? But it's just when the poison would run out, you refresh it. Poison runs out, you refresh it. Uh, but in PvP, it's on a five second ICD. So the uptime is a little bit less, which is probably pretty important. It's similar to over on the Ranger side of things, you know, where you're at high health, you just keep poison on people and that reduces resustain so heavily. It's very dangerous. Uh, and also at the same time, uh, if you take the trait, you get 120 condition damage. So yeah, you'll basically just swap over to this. And I actually do kind of like what the devs are doing here because they're kind of saying, you want to do dagger poison stuff, then do dagger poison stuff. You want to do sword, do sword. It doesn't matter. This will work on everything. This will work on your short bow. This will work on whatever, right? So yeah. That's the adapt section. Over to Mars, Deadly Trapper no longer exists. Obviously, they've called it Even the Odds now. Even the Odds I'm very underwhelmed by. Maybe some Thief players can correct me if I shouldn't be. But it's Inflict 5 Vuln when you steal to someone. Great. Or Gain 5 Might when you hit someone with a stealth attack. Is that really that exciting? But there you go. It feels like this should be in the adept slot, to be honest. These seem way more potent and exciting to me than even the odds does. Uh, and then, so that's the change for Deadly Arts. Now we go to Shadow Arts, which remember up at the top, they said that Shadow Arts was one of the big things they were looking at. We're only just getting to talk about it now. So here we go, Shadow Arts, the, what did they call it? Supportive and survivalist focus line. Well, you're gonna see that they really go ham on those. Shadow Arts traits have been reworked and moved. The new traits are as follows. Minor, so these are your always passives. First, Concealing Restoration. With this new trait, casting your heal skill will give you two seconds of stealth. Already, I think that's incredible, right? That means if you Shadow Art Specialized, Withdraw is now healing you, right? Uh, channeled Vigor is now healing you. Uh, uh, sorry, healing? Uh, obviously, it was always healing you. They're now stealthing you. Withdraw is stealthing you. Channeled Vigor is stealthing you. This is very interesting to me. Uh, and obviously it plays into the whole stealth idea. You got to remember as well though to pick up shadow arts. It is quite costly um, So yeah concealing restoration next meld with shadows in addition to extending yourself Which is all it currently does in the game. I think it's by like one second or something After the patch the trait will allow also increase your movement speed by 50% Now thief players out there will know that there's already currently in the game a trait that increases your movement speed That's basically not a decision anymore that's an always passive it's always because it's being loaded into a minor now and the uh, actual selectable traits are going to have other things so yeah you just always if your shadow arts getting stealth on heals moving faster in stealth stealth is lasting longer and finally shadow siphoning whenever you stealth attack you siphon health now it can't occur more than once per second per target as they say uh, but I'm very interested in what the number is. I mean, is this going to feel like mug? Am I going to feel like I'm mugging every time I stealth attack? Well, like, what, what are the numbers going to be here? Uh, pretty incredible. And this is listed as the third one. So this is the Grand Master Miner. They tend to be a little bit more loaded. Uh, so, wow. Next, uh, we have Adept. Uh, Merciful and uh, Ambush. This trait has been moved to Adept. It no longer increases your revive speed. Instead, it causes applying stealth to an ally to heal and revive them over three seconds. So this is really cool. I like the way that they've thought about this. It means that all you have to do is run over and cast like your blinding powder that you do anyway, or, you know, drop your black powder and quickly cluster bomb in it. 
anything you would do to stealth someone, and I guess we'll mention Shadow Refuge if we must, you are immediately getting the benefit of the trait, no matter what variation of stealthing you go for. I think that's really versatile and a nice way to think about designing the game. So that's pretty fun, and it sounds pretty strong as well. Heal and revive over three seconds just from applying any stealth. And then, obviously, yourself. So you're going to have the luxury, probably, of pressing F and helping out in the same way, too. So picking that up seems nice. A better version of the res trait. Next, Shadow's Embrace. Uh, it's been moved to a different slot in the same tier, but its functionality is unchanged. Now, this is the trait that just meant you would cleanse while in stealth. And uh, so, yeah, it's very strong slot, and I can see why that's pretty much unchanged. Next, you've got Hidden Thief. The trait's been moved to Adept, which is where it now is. Uh, it no longer increases your movement speed, because that's baseline. Instead, it's giving you 20% recharge reduction to your deceptions. Next, for the master stuff, Shadow Savior. This is new. This new trait causes you to heal yourself after shadow stepping. Nearby allies also get healed for double the amount you are. So here it is, guys. The Medic Thief will be born. All you have to do is get your short bow and Infiltrator's Arrow over to someone and you heal them up. Kind of feels similar to what they did with the Druid Staff um, skill earlier. Where it's like you want to cast it on an ally and it will drop the cooldown. Well, here, look, you're going to be Infiltrator's Arrowing over to allies to heal them up. I really want to see how potent this is. Once again, though, they don't give us the numbers, so we can't dismiss it immediately out of hand. It's kind of funny. Leeching Venoms, I like what they go with here as well. The trait's been moved to a new slot, and it's different now. It no longer reduces recharge of your Venoms. Instead, what it does is causes your Thief to stack Spider Venom automatically while in stealth. So I don't know how slowly this is going to stack. Spider Venom is just the basic poison Venom. It's not like got any extra utility or whatever beyond just applying poison. But I guess this means you linger in stealth long enough, you're going to build really high stacks. What's the duration of the stacks? How quickly do they tick in? Is there an upper limit? Or I mean, surely there will be at some level, but where do these things cap out? Interesting thought, isn't it? And then lastly, you can choose from Flickering Shadows at the Master Tier. This is another new trait, and it means you have 33% damage reduction while revealed, which is kind of a turn on the head of the previous damage reduction while you're actually uh, hiding and stuff. So once you come out, you're a little bit sustained. You're more capable of doing things, which is ever the problem with Thief when you uh, try to step outside of your role to a certain extent. Over at the Grandmaster, it didn't actually change much. You know, Grandmasters are usually the big exciting thing. There's not so much going on here. First of all, Cloaked in Shadow. It no longer grants immunity to crits. I think that's probably quite fair. But instead, now you blind to siphon health. Again, that doesn't sound too exciting, does it? But it's the Grandmaster slot. So presumably, that's a lot of siphoning. And you'll notice that if you go top, 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 you're actually kind of getting a lot of heal and resustain in here through shadow stepping and through siphoning on stealth attacks and through blinds. So maybe, uh, maybe we'll actually be quite sturdy. Also, it's not hard to drop like a black powder and then dagger storm in it and you're blinding like billions of times. So it could be like a full heal for any of those combos. You know, the warrior's stolen ability. There's going to be a few of them. Next, shadows rejuvenation. This is heal while you're in stealth. That's not changed. And rending shadow. This is actually really exciting. I like the look of this. Uh, currently in the game, it's rip boons when you come out of stealth. Well, this no longer reduces that and it also reduces damage from bonus foe. Instead, now it fears your foe if you hit them when they have no boon. So I really like that idea of a shadow arts thief jumping out of stealth and scaring their vulnerable opponent who has no boons, right? It's a brilliant idea, and uh, I'd like to see how that works. Interesting to see fear creeping onto some other classes. Obviously, to an extent, Thief kind of has fear if it takes skulls. You know, you're fighting lots of Risen out in awe. You can get skulls and fear them. Well, here you actually get it right there, bang, in the trait. So, pretty curious. Wow, what a lot of stuff to talk about with Thief. And like I said, a lot of wild cards, right? I, gotta, I can only imagine Thief, uh, Thief players are interested in this. I don't think Thief players have had a patch like this with so many, like, divergent things for a long time. Am I wrong? Well, there you have it, guys. Last but surely not least, we do have Warrior, which is, again, a bit of a mixed bag. There's definitely great intent behind everything that the devs are trying here. Some of it, I'm curious whether they've done enough, and some of it, I think they're a little bit off base, uh, but we'll see what they went with, and some of the changes I really wanted are in this, so let's see. They say, we like how the gameplay changes in the last balance update have turned out for Berserker, but we've also heard your feedback and recognize that the damage has been lower than expected for the amount of investment involved. 
And basically, yeah, this is correct. It's actually really tricky to get into Berserk right when you need it and to hold it for long enough to really get value out of your uh, hyper-powerful new bursts and whatnot, right? And many of the weapon bursts just aren't good enough, really. Uh, in this update, then, we're tuning up some Berserker skills and traits to give these builds a little more power and longer windows to stay in Berserk mode. So they're not like making the bursts themselves even more like stupid, but giving you more opportunity to get into the right position and orient for it. The Bloody Raw trait. Now, this is the trait that just gives you a massive damage boost, right? Like a 20% modifier. It's going to be changing its stacking met method, and that will result in a net increase in damage. So, we are also lowering its value in the competitive modes, since Berserker Burst in those modes is already difficult to deal with. Similarly, we're also making adjustments to Rampage to rein in some of its excess power in PvP. So, uh, I very much agree that Rampage should be reined in for its excess power in PvP. You just see Rampage a hundred times a game at the moment, both between Engineers, but particularly Warriors. Ever since the cooldown went from 180 seconds to 90 a while ago, it's just been everywhere. Um, and one of the things I've wanted to see them do is bump that cooldown back up to somewhere in the middle ground. We'll see what the devs go with. Uh, so I agree with that, but then they say here, Berserker Burst is difficult to deal with in competitive modes. No, it's not difficult to deal with in competitive modes. I mean, really, and that's not me being out of touch and ridiculous. It's quite very, it's very well telegraphed and it has very easy parameters to work around. I don't know about what, about what they're going with there, but we'll see the changes. So let's roll on in. Wild Blow will now increase your Berserk extension from three seconds to four seconds. So as long as you're running the Rage skills, this is all about helping you just stay in Berserk for longer. Shattering Blow, same thing. Two seconds to three seconds. This stuff just makes me think of how fun it is to play like a Gunzerker in Borderlands, right? And you play all these things together that just keep you in Rampage or Berserk for as long as possible. And I like the feeling of getting that in Guild Wars too. So yeah, I actually really like these are welcome changes. Mariner's Shot underwater. This is what, Harpoon Gun. This skill now scales damage dynamically based on distance. Looking over at Headbutt, they've done an interesting change here, which is as you cast Headbutt, it now absolutely removes your own stability off of yourself. But if you removed Stab, you get an extra 50% damage on the Headbutt itself. I really like that interaction, though I'm not sure Headbutt is that high damage in the first place. But, you know, the, the headbutt outrage combo, they really want you to be thinking about and going for to stay in Berserk really long afterwards. I'd li I like that they're encouraging this as a thing. I don't know whether they'll really get it, but they have it. This one's interesting. Fear me. The duration of fear applied scales dynamically. They never did that with Necromancer in Core Shroud, despite the fact that there were Core Shroud changes, if I remember correctly, right? And it functions very similar, right? The closer you are, the longer the fear goes. But they have it. So fear me, getting that change. Here's the Rampage thing, and this leaves me scratching my head, but I'm going to trust the devs. Remember, at the top, they say we are making adjustments to Rampage to rein in some of his excess power in PvP. So what have they done? Well, they've changed to recharge 120 seconds in all modes. So, they've split the distance difference. I swear, if you look at the Rampage changes over the years, it's like... We're, we're increasing the cooldown, and then we're reducing the cooldown, and we're increasing it back, forth, back, forth, back, forth. But they've go, gone into the middle now, all right? So we're up from 90. Right now in game, it's 90. After this patch, it will go up to 120, which is still much lower than the initial 180 when no one used it. But, you know, it's it's rained in a little bit. So, yes, they hit the cooldown, and I think this is a perfectly valid way of, of touching it. This other stuff is what confuses me a little bit. They say that it no longer grants bonus toughness. I'm not sure how much bonus toughness you were getting from Rampage. I know you were getting extra vitality. And the damage reduction that it offers has actually been doubled. So it's tankier than it was before. But is it because it no longer has the toughness? Also, the way that it calculates the damage reduction is now multiplicative instead of additive. But shouldn't that make it stronger? So I don't know. We'll see. Uh, but I'm going to trust that they've reined it in. Hopefully, Rampage feels about as squishy as it was before. Maybe slightly squishier. If they're trying to rein it in, I've got to assume that's the intent of this. But there you have it. Then we have a Berserker trait, Last Blaze. This is the one that means whenever you use a Rage skill, you set people on fire. And the burning has gone up from three to four seconds. I'm not sure it's really enough. I would have liked a second stack. Now, that would have been pretty interesting. 
But uh, yeah, uh, a little bit longer duration there. A Spellbreaker Utility Sight Beyond Sight. People really don't run this very much. So they've improved the reveal duration. And the reveal counterplay is actually kind of nice to see in a world with all the shadow arts changes you may have just watched in the Thief section. Bloody Roar. Now, this is a trait that currently is Grandmaster. You pick it up and it's just 20% more damage while in Berserk mode. It's a massive modifier. So what they're saying at the top here is that it's changing its stacking method, which means there will be a net increase in damage. So they have to lower its value in competitive modes, therefore. And I guess they're hoping it will balance out. So what we're going to read down here is a nerf. Bloody Roar. This trait now stacks multiplicative instead of additive. Supposedly that means it's just way stronger. I think it's like what we saw with Symbols and Guardian earlier, potentially. And then they're saying that it's no longer a 20% modifier in PvP and World vs. World. It's a 15%. But PvE... I think you're just getting even more damage on Berserker. You're going to see such big numbers. It's crazy. I'm actually really excited to see this here. But so, yeah, 5% drop to keep it on par with where it was before, I think. And then, therefore, these duration increases are what Berserker will really like to see. So that's pretty much all the Berserker changes until this last one for Warrior, okay? And potentially, this could be the coolest thing in the entire patch. I love that it's the last thing we read on the patch note before the, the post ends. This is something I've been asking for for ages. It's uh, always been hinted at on a tooltip, and now it's actually coming. So King of Fires, right? A Berserker Grandmaster trait that means while you have Fire Aura, if you use a Berserker skill, it explodes. And it says on the tooltip, and it always has said that it does damage and then also burning. But it's only ever applied burning. Okay, so it's always been limited. You could never use that combo on a power-oriented Berserker. But now, look at this. Detonating a Fire Aura now deals flat damage in addition to burning. They're doing it. They actually have the flat damage on there. So we don't get to see the number. But if this is a good amount of damage, this will unlock a really cool playstyle in the game where you can have Berserkers being supported by Tempest that splash lots of fire aura on, aura on them. I take you back to earlier in the video with me and Boots where you see like the double fire auras coming all, all over the place and the sunspot improvements and the smothering auras improvements. This could be super, super cool. I'm really excited to see what they do. Knowing our luck, it will just be a tiny packet of damage just to like break ages or remove a blind or something. But if it's a substantial enough amount, you could have a very, very fun... Uh, uh, sort of duo unlocking with this and I cannot wait to see that. So we see the numbers. I'm not entirely sure though. There you go. That's the warrior section. That's what they've done for the berserker stuff. And that is nine classes out of nine. There you go, guys. I did it. Two hours discussing the upcoming balance. There's so many juicy, interesting things here. I freaking love these patches. Let me know what some of your highlights were, some things that you think were really cool synergies maybe I've missed here on my discussion. And uh, I'll be down in the comments. Honestly, I cannot wait to see what you guys have to say. Uh, I'm pretty excited about a hell of a lot of this stuff. Uh, so yeah, hope that you guys enjoyed the effort that went into this and it's been a really fun way to spend your evening and keep an eye out for another one soon when this patch comes in We're gonna be looking at some of these numbers and the animations and the actual stuff, you know, all the chronomancer new skills the uh, Preparations, there's a lot to see the new mirage trait that supposedly has a different animation on it and we can really get into the nitty-gritty I'm looking forward to that. Hopefully boots will be ready for some more stuff at that point as well. Oh man, good times Take it easy guys, and I'll see you soon Thank you.